The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Welcome to the show. It's Wednesday. We love Wednesdays around here on Autism Live because it's a jam-packed full, full day full of guests and some really special things, and today is no exception. Uh, later on, we're going to be having Evelyn Gould with us, a BCBA, talking about topics of how we as parents can accept where we're at and be in the best possible place to work with our children on that given day. I love it when Evelyn comes in here because she gives me permission to be wherever I am on a given day. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And then, of course, later on at 11 o'clock today, we have Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, my co-host, Nancy Allspa Jackson, a really remarkable woman is going to be with us later on today. And we're going to be showing you some of the other interviews that we did at the Walk Now for Autism, the Los Angeles version, a, two weeks ago, well, a week and a half ago. Uh, so really fun interviews. We had a very good time. And last week, we showed a lot of the interviews that we did with some of the vendors and some of the families. And we'll have some more of those today, too. All right. So I uh, want to remind you that we're going to be with you for the next three hours live here. And we're going to be talking about topics having to do with autism. And how we can be more efficient, more effective, working with our children on the spectrum, helping them to achieve the very highest level that they can. We know they're all different. There is no cookie cutter with autism. But uh, the thing that is the same, the through line that is the same, is that we love our kids and we want what's best for them, right? We talked yesterday about FAPE and how we have to, when we're in the school setting, talk about what's appropriate. But when it's just us, we can talk about what's best. We get to want that for our kids. And how to be the best possible team member striving to achieve the best for your child. How do we show up and carry out the things that we need to do so that we can be productive? Uh, it's a subject that's very near and dear to my heart because if you watch the show, you know I am a mom of a boy who is almost nine years old. It just takes my breath away. I can't even believe we're about a month away from him being nine. And he was diagnosed with autism when he was two and a half. A very difficult time in my life, a really difficult time. But I will say that things started to change for us right after his third birthday when we started ABA therapy. And we were so fortunate. And don't kid yourself, I know how fortunate we were because we lived close enough that we got our treatment from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And that is such a huge thing in my life because I, and I say this all the time, I call it the autism miracle in my living room. They came into my home with therapists and we did five years of ABA therapy. I know, you know, now I talk about it and it seems like somebody else's life, right? Like a movie that I watched, a really long movie that I watched, but it was a fascinating movie with a lot of ups and downs. Um, but in the end, very happy ending because I got my son back and I didn't get him back just at the end of five years. I got him back uh, in pieces, just like I lost him in pieces. He had the kind of autism that was regressive. And I got him back in pieces because they were using really quality ABA therapy. And that's one of the things that's a huge topic here on Autism Live. We're talking about ABA therapy, how we can deliver it, how we can get it, how we can fund it, how we can be really effective teaching our kids. We know that ABA is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. We know that the Surgeon General has referred to it as the gold standard of treatment. And the other thing that's really important to me is that we know that if we give quality ABA therapy in the right amount, that all 
all of our kids will experience progress, all of our kids. Whether you have a child who's very profoundly affected, whether they're 18 years old or 18 months old, or if the child is very mildly affected with autism, very high functioning, we still know that all of those kids and everybody in between can make progress with ABA. We can make very targeted progress to eliminate challenging behaviors that are preventing us from having a life that we dreamt of and preventing our children from reaching their high, highest potential. And at the same time, we can strengthen skills and teach skills to our children so that they lead a more productive life and can do the kinds of things that they want to do. That's a wonderful thing. But it's a huge area to talk about with so many different skills for an individual child to learn. And since they're all children need different skills, there's lots of things to talk about. So that's why we have three hours to talk about them every day. It's a great thing. But uh, this conversation that we're having is, is really meant to be a global conversation. We want you to participate in it. Tell us what you need. I'm just the conduit. I am not the expert at all. Please know that. I am the student sitting in the chair that wants to learn more about autism uh, and, and to grow. But I have access to all these people on your behalf. I have access to experts. So if you have a question, you have something going on in your home and, or something that you're aware of or something that you aren't aware of that you want to know more about, please let us know. Give us your thoughts, your suggestions, your comments, uh, your complaints. If there's something that we're doing here that is not helping you, please let us know because that's what we're here for is you. Uh, there are lots of different ways to get in touch with us. You can, if you're watching us right now on autism, hyphen live.com you'll see across the top of the screen that it either says live or rebroadcast if it says live there's a your questions box and you can type in there hit enter and it shows up here on my screen and we can be having a conversation in that way if it says rebroadcast you can still get a hold of us but one of the ways that you can get a hold of us is through email you can do that 24 hours a day seven days a week we get your email and we will answer it via email and text but we'll also cover it on the next available show. So, and if you're watching us on any other things, uh, any other formats, you can also be emailing us as well. But I also want to remind you that you can call in too. That uh, you, wherever you are, if you want to call in, you don't have to necessarily speak to me in the studio. There are people waiting to take your call to answer your questions. So you can do that. You can Skype in, and we have more and more people Skyping in, doing interviews, whether they're experts in the field of autism or moms or dads, bloggers. We love of being able to Skype with you. It's convenient. You can do it from your home. If you have video capability, then we can see you as well. If you don't, that's okay. We can do just sound and patch you into the show. So there is Skype. You can also get a hold of us on Facebook. Uh, we have a new page that is Autism Live on Facebook. And if you go there, please give us a like while you're there. We're we're the new kid on the block, and uh, so we'll take every like we can get. Uh, but you can also answer the question of the day there. I know we also post the question on the Center for Autism and Related Disorders pages, uh, and you can do it on either place, but we love it when you come to Autism Live. And you can also tweet us, so that's a wonderful thing, and I see more and more of you tweeting on a regular basis, uh, answering the question of the day there, asking questions. That's a great way to get a hold of us. I'm, I'm a tweeter in training, figuring it out. Really, it's evading me, but I'm, I'm working it out. Uh, hey, you can also watch us in other places too, besides autism-live.com. You can watch us on blip.tv. And that's a great place to watch because you can look back at old episodes, you can search a topic, you can fast forward, you can rewind. If you just want to watch Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, you can pull that uh, piece up uh, and some of the other specialized things that we do you can find those on blip TV you can even subscribe to it uh, you can leave us comments there as well uh, you can also watch us on YouTube and what's great about on YouTube is that it tends to be the smaller segments that if you're on the go and don't have a whole lot of time but you say oh you know I really love watching Jonathan Tarbox on Fridays when he does research Fridays you can find those separate interviews on YouTube and all the other experts there on YouTube. Really convenient. You can rewind them. By the way, you can leave comments on YouTube as well. And you can also get us now on iTunes. You can download complete shows, video and everything. Uh, it's free download on all of these different places. You can subscribe
subscribe to it there on iTunes. We love getting iTunes reviews. So uh, we appreciate that. And very soon, very soon, I know I keep promising this, you'll be able to download just the audio uh, if you want to take it. Well, you guys have written in and said that you would like that so you can listen in the car uh, or that you can listen on headphones while you're walking. I think that's a wonderful thing. So that's going to be very soon. I'll make sure that I update you onto that. So lots of different ways to participate in the conversation. We always appreciate your thoughts and comments. Uh, I, it helps us, I think, to be better at what we're trying to do, which is helping you. And I always say, I gave up mind reading to be an autism mom, because uh, I have enough to do, right? <laughs> as an autism mom. Uh, but in any case, we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Uh, this is the part of the day where we take those words, phrases, and anagrams that drive us just bonkers, right? Whenever you're meeting with somebody and talking about your child and they go, well, you know, the OT and the APE wrote the EI, uh, IEP and put the BIP in there and they called the BCBA, what? Have I just stepped into alphabet land, right? Um, but we need to know what those things are <sighs> to a certain extent. I, I think I've given up on trying to understand all of the jar jargon terms, but they're, the ones that come up over and over again, we really want to know what they mean. It's going to help us to be that really effective member of our child's team. It's going to make things more efficient. Uh, you know, think about it if you could spend your time in meetings asking questions that furthered the conversation instead of saying, what did you just say? Right? <laughs> so we have to teach it like we teach our children, small bits, small bite-sized bits that we can say, all right, I can learn that for today. I'm not overwhelmed. I can do this, right? <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about this one today because it's we're talking about things surrounding with school this week. It's really IEP season right now, right? Uh, so our jargon for the today for today is OT. This is something that you'll hear a lot. Oh, there's my phone making noise. Um, this is something a term that we'll hear a lot. A lot of our kids when they go to school, they will be granted some OT hours. And I don't know about you, the first time that I was hearing this, the OT, the OT, the OT, and I said, what exactly does OT stand for? Well, we always give you the actual, and then we give you a somewhat watered down version so that you really can get a grip on. But OT stands for occupational therapy. Now, when my son was diagnosed at two and a half and I met with the school district and uh, in my state, I don't know how it is in, in all of the, your states, in my state, there are some services that are available to your child as, as soon as you do an intake and they see that there is a need, whether you have a diagnosis or not. Um, and then when your child turns three, the school district is expected to take over whatever services at three. Um, which I remember being just shocked by that. Was, he's a three. He's a little itty bitty baby boy. Why are we talking about school already? But that a lot of times is your funding resource um, where, you know, you have to go to them and ask for the things that you want. And so at three years old, they were saying, offering my child FAPE, which is free appropriate public education and saying, okay, so he's going to have occupational therapy. And I, of course, being completely unaware at that time, I was thinking occupational therapy for a three-year-old? What are we talking about here? But in actuality, when we're talking about autism, basically the things that they're going to focus on for the OT with the littler kids, when they get older, they're going to focus on some other stuff. But for the littler kids, they're going to focus on working on fine motor skills, sensory issues, and core strength. Because we want to get our kids academic academically prepared to do the things that they need to do academically, which will also help them on onward as they go through their life. So we were talking yesterday about working about that on that tripod grasp so that we can get the fine motor skills that are going to be involved in coloring and later writing and eventually cursive handwriting, all of those kinds of things. Um, but for our kids, a lot of times there are sensory issues and the OT will help us to address some of those issues. They'll bring in different items into the classroom, whether it's a pad that makes them sit up because so that we can also work on core strength so that we're in the position where when we get the tripod grasp that we can actually do the handwriting. The OTs for my son are, oh man, they hate me with a passion because uh, I believe that these are important things that need to be worked on. I absolutely do. Um, but I always look at it <laughs> 
it's the area where I find that I have the most, I see the most humor in the OT. The first OT that my child was assigned to, with a complete and total straight face, you guys, said to my husband, you know, they had this hanging, stretchy, you probably have seen these in some of the gyms that they have. Uh, it was a like a piece of um, lycra, swimsuit material, right, that was hanging from a, uh, a hook very safe, right? It was a, a, a specific thing. It wasn't like somebody just took a piece of fabric and threw it up there. But it was this little cocoon that the kids could get into, and it cocooned them, and it could bounce, and you could spin it. And um, one of the things that we saw with my son was that if he spinned for any length of time, whatever it did, uh, vestibular, you know, I, I don't know all the terms, but whatever it did for him, it woke up his speech centers so that he could speak just a little bit better after he'd been spun, which was a fascinating little thing. And, um, and it was really good for him when he was upside down. I don't know what he just, you know, tended to do better after he'd been upside down. And so this, in a very straight face, this woman looked, very young woman looked at my husband and said, you know, if you could make this work in your home and for at least an hour or two a day, hang him upside down and spin him. Now I know she meant well, and I know what she meant, but my husband came home and said, apparently she thinks our child's a bat. Um, <laughs> And we laugh about that all the time and picture this purple thing hanging from our, our ceiling. Um, and we did not do that and hang them, but uh, we would spin him in the office chair and hang him upside down and spin him and do those kinds of things. But we wouldn't do it for two hours a day. And I wouldn't recommend that anyone do that, right? I have no idea that would what would that would do to you. But in any case, uh, it's very interesting, the OTs and what they come in with and, and what they, it's a very interesting occupation. There's some fabulous OTs out there and they work really hard. Um, but I'm laughing too because the, currently the, the team that my son works with and they talk about constantly the core strength and sitting up and being able to write. And I always say yes and, you know, but he has no one to model that at home. I have the worst posture in the world and my husband is not all that much better. Uh, so I always say to them, I don't think that's the autism. I think that's just his parents. I think that's genetic. Um, and the fact that I'm uncoordinated, I, you know, and they'll say, well, you know, his coordination, it could be a little bit better. And I go, yeah, you know, I don't think that has anything to do with the autism. So I'm constantly having that laugh with them. Still needs to be worked on, right? Um, but it's always very amusing to me. I like to say puppies don't have kittens. And the fact that my son has issues with core strength and fine motor, yeah, he comes by it honestly. In any case, a really important area for our kids to work on. Because if you're having to work to sit up, for eight hours to sit in a chair to do that, that's just one more thing that you have to be working on um, instead of focusing on what's at hand, right? And we want to minimize other distractions. So core strength, getting our kids to sit up and having the muscles to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I need to work on that too. Uh, in any case, a really important thing that we understand what it is, because almost all of our kids are going to be granted some period of OT. We talked yesterday about how you really want to be careful about how much is push in and how much is pull out. Um, because every time your child's taken out of the classroom to go and work on things, you want to weigh the importance of those things versus what they're missing in the classroom. So I, I'm always the pain in everybody's, you know what, saying, let's do as much pull in, uh, and not, or you push in instead of pull out. I drive them batty. It's my job. I'm a mom. I'm an advocate. Okay, so uh, that's OT. We talked a little bit about APE too. I think that's in our, our jargon later on this week. APA, APE, excuse me, is adaptive physical education. So sometimes those can be really confusing, but OT tends to work on the fine motor, tends to work on the sensory issues and the core strength. And sometimes later on, they'll work on other things, keyboarding, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, our question of the day, we always have a question of the day, and we love it when you guys participate on Facebook, and we'll take a, uh, I don't know if we will have time later on today, but we'll try to check in to see how you guys are answering the question. Wednesdays are busy. Um, but the, the question for today, since we're talking about the schools, is what has been the hardest part of getting your child's IEP completed? Because um, we know you go in for the IEP, and you meet with the team, and they give you the offer of FAPE, the Free Appropriate Public Education, and you can agree with part of it 
or all of it or none of it and have an ongoing uh, discussion. And a lot of times there might be one sticking point or two sticking points where you're not in agreement with the school about the services. So my question to you is what things are you mostly in disagreement about? Um, I've already sort of given it away what ours is, is that I'm constantly arguing about the push in versus pull out time um, to the point where, you know, there have been times when I've let things go when the school has said, well, we either have to pull him out or we can't do it. And I've said, well, then we'll work on APE at home, but I'm not going to have him taken away from curriculum when he has PE hours anyway to go and kick a soccer ball. I, I you know, I think those skills are important, but they have a time and a place and I'm not going to take him away from science and math and history for him to work on the soccer ball. He gets PE. Um, regularly anyway and so to get that extra stuff I'm using skills at home to fill in that blank that's my personal feeling on it and yours might be different um, and I might get to the point where I am you know that I go ah I wished I hadn't done that you know I don't know <sighs> It's hard, right? It's a, it's a walk in that balance beam of trying to figure out what's most important. So love to know for you guys, though, what's hard about getting the IEP? What's the most contentious part of it for you? The part where you can't come to agreement. Would love to know that. Okay. We also always have a topic for the day, and, and in this case, it's the topic for the week, and I'm sure that you've already guessed what it is. We're talking about autism in the schools because... It's a big part of our kids' lives. It's a big part of their day. And I know a lot of you have made the decision, and bless you, I you are stronger than I am, the decision to pull your child out and homeschool them. Uh, I know that that thought occurred to me once a million years ago. But to be completely honest, my son so desperately needs and craves the social. He's an only child, and he needs that social stimuli. I remember... Um, when he was in kindergarten, he actually, even before that, it seems like in kindergarten and in the year that he was in preschool before that, um, both years, for whatever reason, we had the holiday break, came back to school for a week, and both years, he got the flu the week after and was home for the whole week after that. And in both years, what I remember is the day that we took him back to school and how all the kids in the classroom, and these were completely uh, neurotypical kids, he was completely included in the classroom, um, but he, he came to the door, I walked him to the door, and all the kids cheered because he was back. And to see his little body, how that registered for him of, oh, they missed me. Uh, and get see that grin, I, you know, I just, it, it's something that was so great uh, that I don't know that I could ever take that away from him. Um, and I, ha I have the benefit of really good schools and a really good principal and really good teachers. And I know that that is not all of you. Um, so my heart aches for you, but I so admire your strength for if you have have the wherewithal to take your child out and say, no, I'm going to homeschool. I'm going to do this. You are a better person than I. Uh, and I really applaud you for that choice. But for a lot of us, uh, our child, for whatever reason, needs to be in school. And it's a tough thing to negotiate how we set our kids up for success, how we set up our teachers and our aides for success, and how we negotiate this fine line with all the people who are in administrative positions, some of whom have have our children's best and most appropriate interests at heart and some who are, uh, you know, and it's a necessary thing, have to be watching the bottom line. They got to be watching the dollar signs. I don't know how those people sleep at night. I really don't because I don't, I couldn't do that. I could not do that. Um, but I understand that that's a necessary position and we have to figure out how we make that work as parents. So we're talking about autism in the school and all those different ways, setting the kids up for success, helping the teachers and the aides to know how to deal with challenging behavior 
and how to teach our kids. That's what's supposed to be happening in school is the teaching. And in some places it is, not so much in others. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about some play tip today uh, about how we can teach play skills. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have Evelyn Gould, BCBA with us, and Nancy Allspot Jackson is gonna be with us at the 11 o'clock hour for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. This is an hour where uh, sort of outside the rest of the hours here at Autism Live, Nancy is the wonderful executive director of Autism Care and Treatment today. If you are not familiar with them, I hope you'll visit their website. They're a remarkable organization that gives grants to families for the things that the families request. This is a fabulous thing. Instead of just saying, oh, well, we're handing out iPads, right? Which would not be a bad thing, but in some cases, you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, I would take an iPad or another tablet device for my child, but what I really need is a fence because my child runs. Or what I really need is help getting my child diagnosed. I need to cover the cost of an independent diagnosis. Or what I really need is an advocate to go with me to an IEP. Doesn't matter what it is that you need, right? I've, we, there have been, uh, I've seen where people have written in and said, we need a trampoline because our child is really reinforced by jumping on a trampoline and will do anything to work for a trampoline and it calms them and makes their day better and decreases the challenging behavior. And they've given the, the money for trampolines to people who have asked for those kinds of things. So whatever it is, I think what's so brilliant about it is letting the families, because we know, we know what we need, right? Um, so they've given away more than a half a million dollars to families, which I think is um, remarkable. And Nancy is the executive director of that organization. She is one tough autism mommy. Boy, are we glad she's in our corner, right? Uh, and wonderful, the biggest heart in the world. She sees these requests and, and works really hard to be able to grant as many of them as she can. So it's always wonderful when Nancy comes in here. She's a wealth of information and very fun, and she and I went to the Los Angeles Walk Now for Autism the Saturday before last and uh, interviewed a fair amount of celebrities and parents and practitioners. We had a really good time. So that's going to be part of our focus today and we'll have more stuff for you as well. So that's during the 11 o'clock hour with the fabulous Nancy Allspot Jackson. And again, Evelyn Gould, BCBA at 10 o'clock. And when we come back, because we are going to take a break, we're going to talk about uh, play. And in particular, when we do constructive play and arts and crafts with our kids. So stick with us. We'll be back in just a minute. I am grateful for Autism Speaks because they allow families like me to have hope. They're working towards having these children live better lives. There's a space for you. Yeah, there's a world for you, and there's a community that is behind you. And one that has really been able to be the singular voice for people who are involved with and who care about autism. I do have autism, but I don't let that become a disability for me. Autism Speaks is going to continue to help those who need it. And just look at all the stuff they've done so far, and you will be impressed. Three, two, one. to support the walks. We have to raise awareness, but we also have to raise funds to do the work. I'm grateful for Autism Speaks for one main reason, is they are allowing me to focus on the research. The work that Autism Speaks has been doing is critical for keeping autism research on the radar screen. We proclaim 2 April as the World Autism Awareness Day. I'm very proud of the UN and thankful some speaks. Getting the health mandate bill passed in New Jersey particularly, we needed to be able to make an argument, not just do this because it's the right thing to do, but do it because it's cost effective. 
and everyone else told me nothing was wrong with my son. I got information from a website that told me something wasn't right. I am so proud of Autism Speaks for creating these beautiful ad campaigns which have reached people who are not affected by autism and have also created a greater climate of compassion and understanding. It's been really great for Bachman to have gotten involved with Autism Speaks early on. I think everybody here feels like they really make a difference. To make sure that we generate as much money as we can for Autism Speaks so we can all solve this puzzle together. There's no way we could have come this far without our families, without our supporters to date, but there's so much farther we have to go, and everybody's invited to join this cause. We need all the help we can get to make the difference we know we can make. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And as promised, I want to talk a little bit about play skills. I am a big fan of the play skills area because I think it's one of the great under underappreciated, underlooked at uh, areas. When when your child gets diagnosed with autism, and I know having been there and done that, um, a lot of us, you know, what you're hearing about is a delay in social social skills and a delay in language skills, and you're also hearing about a whole host of behaviors that repetitive behaviors that your child is engaging in. Right? Those are the three areas that are build the criteria for an autism diagnosis and so of course I think a lot of us go all right well what am I going to do to help my child in terms of social skills and what am I going to do to help my child in terms of language skills and what am I going to do to work on these repetitive behaviors but most of the time I think we're focused on the social and the language and if you don't agree write and tell me because I you know I just know myself and the moms that I've talked to that that's you know you tend to be the most concerned about those kinds of things and yet there are so many different areas that will go hand in hand with a deficit in these other areas that aren't necessarily a part of the diagnosis, but again, will go hand in hand with it. And what we see is that the, the things that are within the play area will not only help, of course, with the social area, the deficit in the social area, because if you are able to play, you can work on social things, right? But also when we play, it can be something where we're working on language, and it can be something where we're working on fine motor, and gross motor, and adaptive skills, and so many other, really, cognition and executive functions as well, because if play is reinforcing, we can work on almost anything under the guise of play, right? But did you hear the big asterisk there? If play is reinforcing. And what we see with a lot of kids on the spectrum is that when they start therapy, play isn't reinforcing to them. And this is often a big frustration to parents and something that we'll we'll see but maybe not put into context so you know for instance the child that you you give that toy to that cause and effect toy that you push the button and something pops up and it plays music and you know it could be a Sesame Street toy or it could be a Spongebob toy they make them in every possible a Barbie toy uh, a Disney princess toy right but these cause and effect toys exist and you push the button and something pops up and this is something that we give to very small children and that we set in front of them and hope that they're going to enjoy playing with it because there's something reinforcing about it. You push cause and effect, you push the button and this thing happens and it's supposed to be that the child, the baby goes, yay, and, and loves that so that they'll do it again. But for a lot of our kids, we put that toy in front of them and if the child went over to it at all and, and pushed the button once, sometimes they cried when the thing popped up or they saw the thing popped up, pop up and it wasn't of any interest to them whatsoever, so that toy never got played with again. And maybe in the back of our minds and in our hearts, we went, oh, I don't know why my baby doesn't like that toy, right? Um, but we don't, we tend not to push it. Unfortunately, though, when a child doesn't find a toy reinforcing, then it 
it leaves out this whole area where we could be learning and growing. And it, we don't hit some markers in terms of joint attention. I always make this, this uh, gesture because we want to get to the point with toys where we're enjoying them with the, the child, that the child's looking at us and seeing our reaction to the toy. Uh, and that's a huge milestone that children have to meet. But what do we do for our kids when it's either scary to them I mean, flat out aversive, like the toy makes a noise or it does something and they don't want to have anything to do with it, run away from it, or it's just boring, you know, it's a lump that sits over there and they don't care that it lights up and plays music and that, you know, marbles spit out of it and balls shoot out and it's just not interesting to them. Or for a lot of our kids looking at it and they just think of it as work. It's not gratifying to them. What do we do for those kids? Well. If you've been watching the show, we, you know, basic principle of ABA is that in order for any behavior to be maintained, it has to be reinforcing. So already we're in trouble here because if it's not reinforcing, then the behavior is not going to be maintained, right? If play is not reinforcing, the child is not going to go over and do it on a regular basis. And we see what happens when we let that go, that we end up with the 15 year old who doesn't know how to manage their time and sometimes even just sits there and is doing nothing or staring at the TV or staring at an electronic device or only playing one game and not being interested in everything. We don't want to get to that place. By the way, we wouldn't give up on that 15-year-old because we can make other things reinforcing to that 15-year-old as well. It's a lot harder work, but it can be done. What we want to do is start with them very when they're very young, as soon as we can catch them. I say that very young and then I think, well, you know, but wherever you are, Today is a good day to start. Making other things reinforcing to the child. We want play of whatever kind we can to be reinforcing. So we might start with something that's already reinforcing to the child, but then we're gonna gradually branch out from there and take other play activities and start to make them reinforcing. Well, how do we do that? And a lot of times you guys will write in and say, the reinforcing thing is the most difficult thing to understand. And I think I'm actually gonna have Evelyn Gould talking about that in the next hour. Um, because it is, it's really, really confusing. How do we reinforce? How do we know what to reinforce? How do we know when to change it? Ah, right? It's. I think it's one of the hardest things because it involves creativity and keeping track and, you know, letting go of your expectations. I think that that's one of the hardest things uh, about reinforcement. But in any case, let's say that your child is only into uh, horses, um, picking something randomly, but you fill in the blanks. A lot of times our kids will get obsessive about one thing. Uh, and sometimes it's not a toy, by the way. My son was obsessed with the vacuum cleaner as a child. Uh, wanted to take it apart and, you know, constantly deal with the hoses and look at it and examine it. Very interested in the vacuum cleaner. So, but let's say that it's horses, uh, that your child is so into horses. Um, what are you going to do for that? And every time you do a preference assessment, the child is only interested in horses. Well, what we want to do as soon as we can is make other things reinforcing for this child. And, you know, we're going to branch out slowly into other things. And so maybe they've got a plush horse that they're really into, a My Little Pony, uh, and that's great, but so now we maybe we move to a different kind of horse. And we've had Dr. Jonathan Tarbox in here talking about how they've done studies on this, and that when you keep in the same family but just monkey with a little bit, it's more you're more likely to be successful. So you start with a plush My Little Pony, and you go to the hard plastic uh, little horse, and have them play together. Have the horse and the you know if they're playing with the My Little Pony, you come over with your horse, and you're you're playing in terms of that. You may have to do more than that. You may have to pair that with something else that's reinforcing on top of that to make this exciting, right? And then we branch into, well, what? You know, whether it's tickles or, you know, maybe if your child finds running reinforcing that you're running with the ponies or you're, you know, there's a food item that you're pairing with it that when they play with the two ponies together that you're reinforcing that and then fading that reinforcer. You're always praising, but you know, helping to build that other things are exciting as well and starting slow and branching out. But what I wanted to talk about specifically today is constructive play and arts and crafts because there's so many different areas of play, right? Um, but we definitely want to help 
our child to find it reinforcing to do constructive play, and we want to help them to find it con uh, reinforcing to do arts and crafts. Uh, constructive play because it's, there's a whole executive functions element of that that's going to help them. Um, and I think it's both true for boys and girls now, and I think maybe years ago we could have said more for the boys. but. Um, it's, it, it's going to help them to be able to play in lots of different ways. Whether the construction is Legos or sandcastles, um, you know, there is that element of, of being able to play side by side with peers that are also doing that kind of play, but also understanding the concept of, you know, we're, we're building something and how do we, the physics of how do we build something that in the beginning, stack, just stacking the blocks, uh, you know, how high can you get before it tilts over? And how securely do you have to put the blocks up before it will tilt over on its own? Um, can be great, <clears throat> excuse me, for cause and effect. Um, you know, that we build the block as high as we can and we make it tumble down. Some children find the destruction very reinforcing. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. We'll build it as high as we can and then we're going to knock it down, right? Uh, and then building the smaller base and, and building it up higher. This is going to help the child with so many different areas. And, and while you're working on the constructive play, you could be working on colors as well. You could be working on numbers. You can... Um, uh, be working on eye contact. Uh, you can work on taking turns. All these wonderful things eventually that you can get to with constructive play, but you got to make it reinforcing to begin with. And if it is that building it up and letting them knock it down is the reinforcer, all to the good. All to the good. Um, and then, of course, for cra arts and crafts, we're going to see that as soon as they start going to school, whether it's preschool or kindergarten, they're going, there's going to be an element of arts and crafts. Arts and crafts works on fine motor, all the finger and hand skills, um, but c being able to conceptualize things to, it helps with being able to express themselves. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that we don't want to leave out of our child's education. And if we wait until they get to kindergarten to work on arts and crafts, for some of our kids, they're going to have sensory issues. The paste gets on their hands, the glue gets on their hands, they're gluing feathers down, it gets stuck to things, or they get uh, some kind of color on their hands. For some kids, that can be overwhelming. If we start working on this at home and make it reinforcing uh, for our kids to, to play with these things and reinforce them for the, the arts and crafts that they build, a really exciting skill for our children. And it can help them with social skills, help them with language skills, help them with executive functions, being able to put something together and finish it, achieve a goal. It's a lovely thing. We've talked before on the show, and I know at some point we have a video to show that we're not done with yet, but um, one of the things, it's uh, this weekend, is it's coming up again. The Home Depot here in the United States, and, and most of you live close to a Home Depot, on the first Saturday of the month, I believe it starts at 9 or 9.30, they have a wonderful activity for kids that's free. You can go at the Home Depot. You don't have to sign up in advance, which I love. And they have this all, they have these little baggies that have these crafts for kids. Every month it's something different and it kind of goes with whatever the month is. And you may go the first time and say that it's too much sensory for your child because it's, they, it has screws and hammer and uh, they'll give them, lend them a hammer. They give them, a, they give you a, a lovely apron um, and they lend them goggles so that they can wear while they're doing, and they'll lend them a, um, a hammer. And they get this craft in a bag and you open it up and there's instructions and there's all the little wooden pieces that go with it and the nails or the screws or whatever they need. And then at the Home Depot, they have an opportunity to paint it too. They have like a paint station that they can go to and paint the craft. And sometimes there are stickers to be applied. Well, this is so brilliant in so many different ways, you guys, because wherever your child is, it may be that you're taking the two-year-old there and all you're doing is picking up the craft to save it for another time. It's free. But, you know, getting out and seeing the other kids is a wonderful entree to that. Then and, you know, eventually you may get to the point where you just sit there and watch the other kids build so that they're getting used to the sensory of the hammers. Uh, and 
see if the child then wants to be able to do it. And at some point, you can start to try to build. Yes, in the beginning, it's mostly going to be you hammering the little things in. Um, but you've got the instruction sheet there that's got pictures, and you can be pointing that out to the child. Uh, don't try to push it. Like, if the child is not as interested, it comes in time uh, where they see all these other kids doing stuff. Eventually, you know, they, there might be one aspect of it that they find interesting. Like, they may be really into the paint portion of it. So if you have to build it and, and then they paint it, it's a really wonderful thing and they can work on so many skills and it can be a social time and it's free. Don't we love that? So that's at the Home Depot the first Saturday of the month. So that will be this Saturday. You can call and check on the time, but it's either 9 or 9.30 and you can show up a little bit late. They're very flexible. What's also great about it, you want to talk about reinforcement for the kids. When they're done, they hand their hammer back in and their goggles back in. They get to keep the apron, which is very reinforcing. And they are given a pin to put on their apron. If you have a little, little child, you might want to put that aside for them. But it's very pretty little glossy pin that they get. And they get a certificate that says that they completed the project, whether they did or they didn't. And Home Depot is really committed to helping our kids, too, and being patient with our kids. So literally, if you say, it's going to be too much for my child, I need to take it home, they're happy to give it to you to take home. You just don't get the benefit of the paint station. So, uh, but I know some people that take the craft home, build it at home because it's less sensory stuff so they can do that. And within the hour, come back and paint it at the paint station. So you can always do that. We Don't we love the Home Depot? It's a wonderful thing. Uh, okay, we have to take a little bit of a break, but uh, when we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about, more about reinforcement and when you're working with a team, how you reinforce the team. Team. So stick with us. My name is Jennifer Yakis. I'm a CARD senior clinical supervisor and a senior trainer. What is a task analysis? What is a task analysis? Very common question. Um, a task analysis is um, breaking down a complex behavior chain into small components. So many of the, the skills that we need to teach our children are not single step activities. It's more a um, multiple step sequence of events that needs to occur in order to have a final product or a final result. So with many children, it's difficult to learn a whole sequence of events all at once. Um, and so using a task analysis, we're able to break down that complex behavior into small individual components, teach those individual components, and then gradually link it all together. When do I actually need a task analysis? When you need a task analysis is when you are dealing with um, a sequence of events, a routine that is involving the child performing multiple actions in a certain order. An example might be uh, brushing teeth, or getting dressed, or even um, reciting a sentence. So anything where there are multiple pieces of skill that need to be strung together um, in order to produce the desired result. Do I need to do a task analysis, or will skills do it for me? Some of those are already provided within skills. So we have many of the adaptive skill areas and the motor skill areas um, within skills that provide task analyses for your child, for the particular skills that you might need to teach. Um, they're broken down into very minute steps. So what you might need to do as a parent or as an educator would be to look at the task analysis that is provided to you by skills and then individually tailor that task analysis for your child depending on their specific needs. Some children might need every single step planned out for them. Some children might be able to do a more general task analysis of three or four steps. So it depends on your child and their ability to perform those skills already, as well as their ability to comprehend the actual sequence of events. And can you give me an example of how to do a task analysis and, and how it will actually teach me to do a skill? So if you were looking at brushing teeth, you might break it down into child picks up his toothbrush, he grabs the toothpaste, opens the toothpaste, puts toothpaste on the toothbrush, brushes the different areas of his teeth, 
um, spits out the toothpaste, rinses, and then dries his mouth. Um, so that would be an example of a task analysis. So how a task analysis might help you teach a skill is that it is probably going to be easier for your child to focus on one particular piece of that skill and learn that to mastery, which allows them to access praise and reinforcement early on. Um, it's going to be a much more successful positive learning experience because it also allows you to hone in on that specific skill, teach it appropriately, fade out your prompts, get the child to do it independently. It's just more manageable for both you and the child. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. And one of the things that we talk about from time to time on the show is, depending on how you're experiencing ABA in your home, uh, you probably have a team of people that you're working with. It may be that the team of people that you're working with is coming from your provider and that they've picked those people and they're in your home and there's a schedule that you get and they show up and uh, somebody else is designing your child's program for you, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. It's what I had the benefit of. Or it may be that you're in a remote place and so, for instance, you might be using the card workshop model where you're actually hiring your team but you're having Having somebody like Card, an outside ent entity that they bring a supervisor to you once every couple of months to supervise the team and help them to know what kinds of things to be working on next and work on training, but the, the main portion of the scheduling falls to you, that you've hired these people, you're scheduling them, uh, whether you're paying them or they're volunteers, and we've seen both models of that be successful, uh, that there are volunteers who are out there who are willing to work uh, for, for your child and with your child and be very effective. Or it may be that you're using skills and CARDI learning and you're creating your team with your family and again either with, some, with somebody that you're hiring to come in or some volunteers or family members that you're using. But in any case, you're probably working with a team. And we hope that there's at least a couple of you that are working because we talk about all the time that in ABA, generalization has to be planned for from the beginning and in order to get generalization we need to be mixing it up and not just having one person constantly be delivering the lessons to a child because we don't want to train the child to that one person right we want for the child to be able to respond appropriately to all the things that we teach within a wide variety of circumstances locations people um, so you got to have more than one person uh, you know I would say really you got to have more than two people uh, to be as successful as possible, to give yourself the recipe for success. But in any case, we're all working with a team, right? And we talk all the time about reinforcing the child and how important that is. And if we want to see any behavior be maintained, we got to make it reinforcing for the child. And from time to time, we talk about making it reinforcing for ourselves because we forget that, that it's got to be reinforcing for us. This is a marathon. It's a long haul. ABA gives our child progress, but it doesn't happen overnight. We have to be able to do this for a minimum of two years. And how are you going to keep that up if it, there's not some element of it that's reinforcing to us? A lot of times our kids' progress is the thing that's reinforcing, but we also want to build other things in as well. One of the things that when I was going through this, and I had a wonderful team of people that came that I didn't have to hire them or train them, but they showed up at my door. And what it didn't, I knew that I was supposed to be reinforcing my child. Occasionally I thought about reinforcing myself, but I'll tell you, and it's embarrassing, it never occurred to me that I should be paying some attention to reinforcing the team. It never, ever occurred to me. Yes, I'm embarrassed, huevos, rancheros all over my face, but I'll tell you when this came up for me was that last summer, uh, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders had a huge event. Um, they do a retreat every other year, and people from all over the world, therapists and supervisors uh, from the different offices that they have all over the world came together, and they had a week of these intensive sessions of training and discussing, you know, all the things to be more efficient helping our kids. It was really amazing. And 
And as a parent, I, you know, I got to go in and interview people and I was truly, truly amazed. And at one point they were talking about what are some of the challenges that the therapists face uh, out in the field. And somebody brought up and said, well, you know, sometimes uh, it's really hard for the therapists because the parents are going through so much um, that, you know, a lot of times they don't acknowledge um, and, and we need to find more ways of making it even more reinforcing for the therapist because this is a hard job. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. This is a really, really hard job. And so they were talking about how they could make things more reinforcing for the therapist because they're walking their talk. And as a parent, I was sitting there and I was slinking down in my chair and going, oh my gosh, uh, this is so true that I was one of those parents and I was totally in my hurt existence and in my child's existence and everything that was happening to us, I was feeling and it never even occurred to me that I might want to be reinforcing my team. But it makes sense, right? If we want to keep quality people working with our children, whether they're getting paid or they're volunteers, right? It really doesn't matter um, because we know when we work our jobs, whether it's our job is being mom or dad, we know we like to be reinforced beyond the paycheck, right? I know my son loves me. That's my big paycheck, right? Um, and he doesn't have to tell me for me to know that. But on a day when I cook something and he says, mom, that was really good. <gasps> then I just want to do it more, don't I? I want to like, you know, really take things out and cook them uh, all that much more. Aren't we all that way? And think about it for here's this team of people that is working with your most precious thing on this planet, your child. If we take the opportunity to reinforce them uh, above and beyond whatever, if they're getting Getting compensation, if they're volunteering and they're getting, you know, credit for that through their college or their sorority, whatever it is, um, and you're offering to write them a letter of recommendation, all of that is wonderful. But we mustn't forget that we need to reinforce on a regular basis, that we need to praise, that we need to figure out what is reinforcing. And so if we praise somebody and we see that they then, you know, they're smiling and they're standing a little taller and they're a little bit, you know, more refreshed to do their job, then we know that's reinforcing to them. But it may be that uh, there's an occasional, whether it's a Starbucks card or, you know, it doesn't have to be something where you spend money, uh, that it's that you write a note to whoever their boss is or their supervisor and say, this person is doing a really good job. Um, but finding the way to make it even more reinforcing for them, um, because we want to have their behavior continue, right? We want for them to enjoy working with our child and to see that they're making a difference. And you know what it's like on a daily basis. Some days, you know, you're in there and you're getting it done um, and it becomes about that and not seeing the big picture. So if we remind them on a regular basis and say, you know, you are making a difference in my family, you're making a difference in my life, but more importantly, you're making a difference in my child child's life. Yes, there's so many other ways that they get reinforced, but why would we want to leave ourselves out? Because sometimes we don't think about it, right? I'm certainly guilty of that, but I pass that on to you so that maybe you can do better than I did because uh, reinforcing is worth it. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have the fabulous Even Evelyn Gould with us. She's a BCBA. If you have questions, now is a good time to start asking them. I think we're going to be talking about reinforcement, but if there's something you want to talk about, send it over right now in those myriads of ways that we've talked about. Email, uh, you can call us, you can Skype us, whatever you would like. But stick with us. Back with Evelyn Gould in just a couple of minutes. Put your shirt on. Oh, really? Whoa. Whoa. Oh, really? 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 Oh,
he bit me. He got hurt. He oh, got he hurt. On Tuesday. Tuesday morning. He bit me good. Was it? Oh, it was aggression. Like, was there a consequence? I, I, I snapped at him and he cried. And I'm unexpected too. Yeah. Or, and he doesn't fight out of a cry. Yeah. He never did it's that it's, before. It's, it's this sort of this week. No, no, yeah, uh, the girls have been telling me like just about every session he's yeah, trying to Mary, bite Mary, them. Mary, we tried to bite her hand because she didn't, he didn't want to walk. Yeah. And, and they, so we took him out again yesterday. And it didn't start out well, but I think it ended up okay. Which his reward was he could if he would walk to the count of twenty, he could jump with mommy and daddy. We would have him jump, and that seemed to be enough of a reward for him to try to yeah. keep going without you know, going limp or trying to fight. Five jumps and then take twenty steps. So would it be okay if we went for a walk about like nine thirty? Sure. No. Okay, nine forty five. I'm just kidding. Are you in bed? Hey, what's your name? Mighty typewriter. And how old are you? Two. When's your birthday? I said go beach. <laughs> oh, cool. That's soon. Are you worried about the fighting? Um, a little bit. Um, because I know a lot of our kids do it to get a reaction or um, to do it just, you know, out of protest that they don't want to do something. Um, I just don't want it to become an issue and become a behavior where it'll he'll generalize it to everybody else, like his family, um, therapists. So far, it doesn't sound like it's been happening a lot. Um, I just wanted to do it today just to see what the antecedent is and why he's doing it. Is it because he wants an extra minute to play or he doesn't want to, you know, transition from outside inside yet? Just to see what's actually going on. No, stop. 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 Stay with mommy though. Nope. Hold my hand. Stay with mommy first. Uh, Hold my hand. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Settle, dude. You wanna what you wanna go to you count to twenty? Should you count to twenty? And then you get little mermaid or do you wanna play? Okay, count to twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Well, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, 19, 20! Yay! Come here, we'll, we'll walk. Yay! Let's walk. Let's walk. Let's walk. Stand up. Oops. 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 Okay, ready? One, two, three! Oh, ready, 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 ready. What do you want? No. Hello, Tantrum. Stand up. What do you want? Tell me. I want. Okay, then let's walk for 20 steps 20 and then steps you can get mermaid. Can have her. Okay, let's Ready? go. Usually I just let him go free because he's been in therapy all day. Right. So that's part of he he expects to be able to just run. I would suggest he just to get his compliance under control first. You give him an instruction, he complies, you give him his little freedom. Because I know he wants to run around, give him words to use, like, you know, give me one more minute or, you know, I want more grass. Yeah. Jack. or be consistent about the rules outside. Like, you yeah. know, when I ask you to come here, you gotta come here. You know, I mean, if, if he's just not behaving, if he's not doing anything we ask, is it okay to pick him up and say, okay, we're going in? I don't know what to do. I mean, I get so frustrated. I think, well, the only, the only option I have is can, let's, we're going in. And, I'll, and he won't go in with me, so I pick him up. I can't do when he's 10, of course. Now it's like his, his main, his main uh, weapon, is just, weapon is to just lay down. Yeah. My suggestion would be um, ask him to come here, but just, you know, give him hugs or say what's up, but then have him run again. Right. So that when you finally do give him the instructions, he's not 
you know, too upset about it. Yeah. Because, because um, sometimes when you ask him to come here, he'll put up a fight because he knows that means I gotta go now. So if every if every now and then he comes here and just gives you a hug, gives you a kiss, gets to be free, then he it won't be such a bad such association. A, yes. It was a nice experience. Right? Okay. Uh, the last couple times have been seriously to where I, I didn't even want to take it outside again. Uh, uh, just so traumatic. With the little mermaid? Oh, here you go. Oh, here you go. Dumb mermaid. Here you go. Come down. Come down. Oh, my goodness. Oh, go show Susie the little mermaid. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Yeah, you are wearing a shirt. I'll be right back. You'll be right back. I'll be right back. Oh, yeah, that's too fun. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters. And our special guest, because it's 11 o'clock on Wednesday, is Evelyn Gould. She's a BCBA, and you're an awesome BCBA because you have great experience with autism. And on top of that, uh, you take into consideration what the parents have going on. So uh, I always appreciate that. And I... I, you know, I'm always thrilled to have you here, but it seems like the running theme lately has been reinforcement that this is where, you know, as parents, we can, we begin to understand, okay, this is how I'm going to teach my child and it makes sense to us. Okay. In order for any behavior to be maintained, I've got to reinforce it. But then when it actually comes to reinforcing, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect for us in the mm -hmm. beginning. So t tell us define reinforcement for us because I think that's a little confusing for us too. Mm -hmm. So let's start there. What is reinforcement? So reinforcement is when the consequence that you provide immediately after behavior results in that behavior either maintaining or increasing in the future so it's more likely to happen in the future. That's what reinforcement means. If okay. it's not, if the behavior isn't increasing or it's not maintaining then reinforcement hasn't occurred. So a reinforcer is basically um, something that you're providing contingent, so dependent on the behavior happening, that then means that the behavior is more likely to happen in the future. Okay, so in it's one of those confusing things mm -hmm. that you can't actually know if it was reinforcing until afterwards. Exactly. So you, you really technically when we're talking about reinforcers, we should be talking about potential reinforcers. Okay. Because <laughs> they're potentially going to um, result in that behavior, in the behavior, whatever it is you're trying to work on um, being more likely to happen in the future. But you te you don't know if it's act actually functioned as a reinforcer till afterwards and you see what happens with the behavior. And I think this is where some of the confusion comes in because I want it to be black and white. Mm -hmm. I really want, I just want you to explain mm -hmm. it to me and go, this is what will maintain this behavior. Mm -hmm. And I want my child to behave in that way. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing black and white about this. But what's good about it is, is that it cuts us a little bit of slack so that we say, okay, I'm going to see if this is reinforcing. Mm -hmm. And if it is, I'm going to make note of that, but it may not be. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you can have things that are where you're kind of, this is very likely to be a reinforcer because mm -hmm. we all have things which we are very motivated for. Right. And so there'll be things which you kind of have a very, very 80% chance that they probably are a reinforcer, but, you, but technically you just don't know for sure. Yeah. And it can depend on a lot of things. Like something could be, could act as a reinforcer for certain behaviors, but not for others. For example, like dependent on the effort, I might be, you know, a piece of cake might motivate me to do one small thing, but it's not going to motivate me to run a marathon necessarily. Right. So there's lots of different kind of factors that can right. then come in. And equally, like if you're asking your child to do something that's very, very difficult, what's re reinforcing? going to reinforce that behavior might be different from if you're asking them to do something that's very easy for them. Yeah. Yeah. And when our kids are older and when our kids are on the high functioning end and they're very verbal, we can have discussions with them mm -hmm. about what would mm -hmm. be reinforcing enough for this. Mm -hmm. But for the little ones or for kids who aren't verbal or kids who are more profoundly affected, mm -hmm. there's a, the added frustration of, well, how uh, these are the kids that I really want to want to be able to help and how can I figure that out? So. Yes. So how do we figure out 
what the likely reinforcer is going to be? Well, I think there's a number of things that you can do. Um, first of all, observing your child just on a daily basis. And most parents, you know, obviously you're going to be observing your child a lot and you're going to notice the things that he gravitates towards. You're probably going to have a good idea of the types of things he tends to seek out. Right. Um, or the things that he tends to drag you, you know, drag you across the kitchen for. Like you're, you're going to know, and then that gives you an indication, well, he tends to gravitate towards things with Thomas on or he he tends to gravitate towards the things that make noise or lights or whatever it is right. or books or things like that so it's likely that those things might work as reinforcers right. you can also do a sort of preference assessment where you choose a few things you think might work and you put them out in front of your kid and see which one that they gravitate towards yeah and they just kind of like will reach for it or look at it or or indicate in some non vocal way that they're interested in it right and then you can kind of um, do process of elimination. So if you put out four things and the kid kind of gravitates towards one or maybe gravitates towards one or two, then you mm -hmm. remove the ones that he just seems not interested with and then you can put those two things back out and see if right. he has a preference for one over the other. And, and then, you could even potentially mix in other things as absolutely. well. Absolutely. And then, of course, there's just trying it out. I think that's often the best way, especially if you're stuck and you're kind of, I know he likes these two things, but he doesn't seem to like anything else. I don't know what else he likes. And, and this is something that all therapists should be doing. And like if I go out to a kid's home and I'm doing an initial like assessment or meeting and I just, I don't know the child at all. Right. So I tend to just go with, I know that, you know, for, through experience of working with kids, you kind of generate a bank of things that you know a right. lot of kids like. Equally, a lot of kids really hate those things too, yeah, but yeah. you just start pulling stuff out of the bag and just having a go um, right. and seeing whether the kid likes it. And the other thing to remember is sometimes kids, sometimes, and ourselves as well, like we don't like things immediately. Right. New things are not always reinforcing. Right. And sometimes like you might need to try it and kind of, um, keep initiating whatever mm -hmm. it is or getting your child to engage in it a few times before they suddenly start going oh actually this is really fun because yeah. sometimes you know yourself i know for me anyway when i'm starting doing something new my initial reaction is like oh i don't i don't know what that is or i don't right. i don't know what not, the rules are i'm not interested right in right it's like, or it's a wee bit stressful because I don't know what it is, but after a while you get used to it, and it, it, you know, like a good piece of music, the more you kind of listen to it, the more you're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. So sometimes you just have to, it's about trying things out, just, you know, try new things. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, and maybe, I mean, obviously if your kid really reacts like, ah, yeah. you know, cause some kids like, for example, really hate when you blow up a balloon and you let it go and it flies all around and they yeah. really, really don't like that. They're really frightened by that, but then other kids love it. Love so it. Yeah. if your kid has a really bad, like a fear reaction or something, then clearly that's not going right. to work. But if they're just kind of indifferent about it, maybe you want to try it a few more times and see if they get interested in it. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking too, at some sometime we should make a list of all those kind of mm. intro things that therapists yeah. do like the balloon because it doesn't I have occur actually to me. got I made mm. some lists of um things that can be potential reinforcers because it is very hard when you go to a home and as a therapist and therapists tend to get stuck in a rut and you just can't yeah. think, you know, we're on the spot and you just can't think of something to try yeah. or something to do. And so yeah. we did put, me and some colleagues did put together some lists to give therapists and parents awesome. as well and be like, you know, try try this or try that or think about this or think about that because it can be hard to, just to off the top of your head to think of things because don't forget that, well, you know, we're adults, so we don't necessarily think of things as being rewards that our yes. kids find rewarding. And I find a lot like it's not the big flashy, crazy things that yeah. kids really are excited about. And I mean, sometimes they are excited about those things, but it's the really simple, yeah. silly little things, like really cheap, simple things like those little pop up, you know, they're like a little piece of rubber and you turn them inside out yes. and you put them on the table and then they like pop up. And there's a delay that it has to rework uh -huh. itself and pop, yes. Like really, and those are really cheap, like things yeah. like that or like those little, I find kids really like those little wooden toys. I used to get them for Christmas as a child. I don't uh -huh. know if they make them anymore, but they're, there's like a little base and then you have like a little animal on top and when you press it, the base yes. in, the animal like flops over and then yes. you release it and they pop up again. And yeah. those things are very cheap, very simple, not flashy at all. And kids yeah. really like them. And I uh, think you were saying, <laughs> yeah, and you were saying, Shannon, I think one time about Jam really liking something very simple that didn't even occur to you. And I can't remember what it was now. 
and there's we so expect, many things. Yeah, we covered. We should get it. We should pull it up again. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, at Christmas time during the holidays, we covered. There was a blogger, a dad, who who wrote about the top five toys of all time, mm -hmm. and like number one was a stick, yeah. and number two was dirt. <laughs> and number three was a, was cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, it was those kinds of things. And string, I think, mm -hmm. was one of them. A lot of those things, in all fairness, are things that have to be monitored yes. because there's yes. the potential for harm. Mm -hmm. And but they're toys that allow for great creativity. Mm -hmm. And but Jem loved a cardboard box. Would mm -hmm. do all kinds of things with a cardboard box. And somebody mm -hmm. got him for one of his birthday. Like about four or five people got together, mm -hmm. and there was a whole system of these tubes that have mm -hmm. magnets, and you could attach cloth to him so he could build anything from a pirate ship to a tower mm -hmm. and he had a lot of fun with that mm -hmm. for I mean like probably two three weeks a really good time and then he went back to doing cardboard boxes mm -hmm. it was a very expensive toy mm -hmm. um, but he loved to build a fort with cardboard boxes and paint with them and turn it turn it into mm -hmm. a robot and mm -hmm. Uh, and use his creativity. So mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing what it is. what kids um, and I, that wouldn't have occurred to me. I know, and um, I've had kids who really love things like being rolled up in a duvet, and yes. then that's a, that's a requesting opportunity too. So you can get them to be like roll me or roll, and then you roll them a little bit, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more, mm. and they just love that. And it's like so simple. Yeah. Just being, but you wouldn't necessarily think about that. Being yeah. Like maybe maybe he'll really like being rolled up in a rug. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> but, yeah. So you just have to try things out. Or and and you know kids for some reason some kids really like I don't get it because I think it feels really weird but they like the jelly arms you know you yes. grab someone's arms and you do that with your arms and I think it feels horrible but some kids really like that so it's just you just have to try these yeah. things um, and maybe that maybe we can give you the list because that is it probably that. is very useful actually in fact can we make sure that we have that next week and we'll go mm -hmm. through it next week mm -hmm. that'll be great that'll be our promise to you that next week at this time we'll have that list for you and we'll discuss it on the mm -hmm. show we should take a break but when we come back we're going to talk more about reinforcement and how we deliver reinforcement with evil and gold so stick with us Skills is a revolutionary web-based program that incorporates comprehensive assessment, curriculum design, progress tracking, and treatment evaluation for children with autism all in one place. Developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, our approach is based on over 40 years of research on the principles of learning and their application to improving the lives of children with autism. How does skills work? Created with speed and simplicity in mind, Skills was modeled on an easy three-step process. Step 1. Start Assessment Step 1 begins with our Intelligent Assessment System, which consists of a series of questions. This assessment is essential to identifying your child's level of skills compared to their typical peers across all areas of development. This includes assessing social, motor, language, adaptive, play, cognition, executive functions, and academic skills. Every skill has an assigned age which indicates when the skill emerges during typical development. This means that each child is automatically presented only with lessons that are relevant to his or her age. Step 2. Choosing Activities It's now easier than ever to build an individualized treatment plan. In Step 2, you are presented with an individualized pool of activities that are directly linked to your student's assessment results. Each activity represents a specific skill that has been indicated by the assessment as needing to be taught. Activities are categorized by curriculum and then by lesson. There are three main types of skills, building blocks, fundamental, and expansion skills. Fundamental skills are necessary for successful everyday functioning. Building blocks are prerequisites to a fundamental skill. 
Expansion skills are non-essential skills, but may provide further enrichment in certain areas. After reviewing the activities available to you, you can quickly add your chosen activities to the treatment plan by simply checking the box and clicking the button. Step 3. Start Treatment Once you have selected and added the activities you want, you are ready to begin teaching. Skills provide you with all the tools necessary to design and manage an effective curriculum plan, such as printable activity guides that are customizable by the teacher, supplemental teaching aids including printable data sheets, teaching guides, visual aids, worksheets and tracking forms, detailed IEP goals and benchmarks for each activity, brief and visually appealing video tutorials, a variety of treatment progress and clinical timeline charts, and lots more. And since Skills is completely web-based, everything you need is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in one easy-to-access location. Skills users even benefit from unlimited access to a support community, where they can ask questions and share ideas with a Skills expert. Skills is always with you. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And our wonderful guest, because it's Wednesday, we're in the 10 o'clock hour on Wednesday. Our guest is Evelyn Gould. She's a BCBA. And uh, I always love when you're here talking to us because you say things in a way that's very practical that we can understand. And you have a lovely Irish lilt to the way you say it that just <laughs> adds, makes, it that much, <laughs> makes it that much more interesting. We had a question during the break. And the question is, would footwork slash brain training workout routines help with development? And uh, well, yes, I'm, I, I think, don't know what that means. No, well, I think what that person's talking about is um, some kind of workout routine that's designed to activate different parts of the brain. And it's probably like coordination, footwork, movement type mm -hmm. things, like where you're supposed to be training different parts of your brain. I think that's what it is, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and as it's hard for me, I can't really say whether it would help with development. I'm not sure if you're talking about development overall or brain development or motor development or whatever it is. And I can't really comment on that because I'm not really, I don't know anything about research. Okay. Um, on, on this particular thing, On that thing, particular, yeah. uh, well, the brain training workout. But I mean, uh, from just what I'm thinking, I don't think it, it's not going to do any harm. I can't say that it would do any harm, and it, it it's likely that it may help with motor development in right. terms of increasing coordination and balance and and muscle tone and and so on. So from that point of view, I could see it working. Um, in terms of other areas of development, I just I'm not sure right. at all. So. If there's research, we're not aware of it, mm -mm. and so hard to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but interesting, and would love to know more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but we were talking before the break about reinforcement, how you deliver reinforcement, how you know what's reinforcing, mm -hmm. and you gave us some great tips of some things, and you're going to bring in us a, a, a list mm -hmm. next week of some things that to try. Uh, to try with kids to see if they're reinforcing, which mm -hmm. I love. Um, but I think that some of our confusion as parents it comes with when we go to deliver the reinforcement and how we do it and and I watch therapists do it and they're so nuanced in the mm -hmm. way that they do it um, I still am not that good at it but let's say that we're doing DTT the discrete trial teaching and we're doing mm -hmm. um, 10 trials of something mm -hmm. and so that we've we've done the preference assessment and we kind of know what we think might mm -hmm. be a good reinforcer for this particular activity mm -hmm. and the child does something and we have to prompt them them to do it are we reinforcing when we prompt them to do something okay so first of all just yes. you know rein, being skilled at rein, delivering reinforcement is hard okay so um, it's not just so me it's not, it's just, not just the people who are writing in it's you, difficult absolutely okay. and it's something that you have to learn you know you have to train yourself to, to do it and some people are just really good at it naturally they mm -hmm. seem really natural at it and some people some some therapists um 
it doesn't come naturally and it takes a bit of training and it because I think oh, generally as human beings reinforcement doesn't come naturally yes it's just not the way that we're programmed and also because our kids don't um, learn in the same way necessarily as mm -hmm. we do we have to kind of use reinforcement differently from how we would so Shannon okay. if I ask you to do something and you do a good job and I, I'll send you a wee email going Shannon you're amazing I love working with you that's really reinforcing for you and that's yeah. just me telling you but for our kids us just going that's great great job or whatever really good they might you know that may not act right. as a reinforcer for them so we have to work a lot harder at it um, obviously our our goal is that eventually we will be able to just say to our kids, uh, "Well done, that was great," um, and they and that will act as a reinforcer, right? Or that they will start to find um, some things intrinsically motivating, so that they'll start kind of doing things because it makes them feel good, right? And that's our ultimate goal. But initially, we probably are going to have to work towards that, and so we have to start off working a lot harder. <laughs> So it's kind of exhausting, I think. Cause, like I remember just working with kids and just dripping with sweat because I'd be bouncing off the walls and mm -hmm. like running around and throwing them up in the air and um, doing all sorts of very energetic <laughs> reinforcement. Yes. I was talking about when Peter Farrick <clears throat> started at our house mm -hmm. and Peter can be very loud mm -hmm. and uh, we were in a condo is sandwiched in between. Mm -hmm. We were like the middle condo so there were people on top and on the mm -hmm. side and uh, a lot of them worked during the day, thank goodness, because I would always say we're going to get kicked out because <laughs> Peter would be in, in the living room with my son and he'd be like, yeah, good job and throwing him and my yeah. son would be squealing with delight and I would go, they must think that we are having a rave. <laughs> in my living room yeah. um, but it was working uh -huh. um, and we weren't being kicked out so mm -hmm. I said well we're gonna let this go mm -hmm. um, but very interesting to me I also have to say Evelyn that I think especially when we've been in a place as a parent and it's taken us a little while to get to ABA mm -hmm. and our child has been engaging mm -hmm. in a lot of challenging behaviors it was difficult for my husband and I in the beginning just to do the praise yeah it's very it, that's totally right it's very it can be very difficult going going from that situation to just forcing yourself to give even praise it feels very unnatural and yeah. you know also I totally understand sometimes if you're thinking like why should I be praising my kid for doing this one tiny thing which they should be doing anyway right, you know right. that kind of thinking or it just feels really fake as well yes. like if you're not used to yelling and screaming and jumping around and being like Whoa! like it just feel you can feel ridiculous yes. and you feel silly and it doesn't it just yes. feels fake it feels foreign mm -hmm. it feels foreign but i will say that the more you do it the more it feels right and the more enjoyable it gets and i think mm -hmm. it's a really good mm -hmm. thing for us to get in the habit of praising all mm -hmm. the time and going woohoo mm -hmm. and celebrating and being yeah because mm -hmm. that feels good it after does. a period of time. Well, you start getting reinforced for Yes, it. <laughs> exactly. So the, the giving, giving the reinforcement becomes reinforcing for you. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so getting back to what you're saying, it's difficult and it, you have to... So it's difficult on so many levels. So you've got like the fact that it's just difficult because it doesn't come naturally to any of us. We're right. much more about noticing things that are wrong than exactly. we are about noticing things that are right. And that goes for all human beings. And it can feel weird when you start doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then it's also, well, what on earth do I use? So that's that's hard, learning like, well, what types of things can I try? And then of course there's like, well, okay, now I've figured out something to try and I'm getting over the weirdness of it, but mm -hmm. when am I supposed to do it? How do I do right. it? Like, what's the, what's all this stuff about differential reinforcement and do this yes. and don't do that and correction and la 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 la. Like, it's very overwhelming. It's, right. a, it's, it's hard and it's a learning process and the therapists have to learn it as well. Like, mm -hmm. they, they don't come they don't come like Peter. <laughs> they have to learn how to be that. But but again, people like Peter are clearly also naturally. It comes more natural yes. to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. exuberant. Mm -hmm. And it, it can change from kid to kid. You know, some kids, you know, you just click with, and you. It's very easy for me. I'll be like, oh great, they're they're this kind of kid. He likes all the boisterous stuff and all this kind of thing. And then I might go work with another kid, and we're like not quite clicking, and I'm trying to figure them out, and they're trying to figure me out, and it mm -hmm. takes a wee bit longer for mm -hmm. us to get into the the kind of comfortable rhythm of reinforcement so yeah and sometimes they're different I, I talk all the time about the fact that everybody else could be loud and boisterous mm -hmm. and screaming and going woohoo with my son and he found that very reinforcing mm -hmm. but if I'm loud even mm -hmm. now he's like he doesn't, well, like, it. Mm, doesn't mm -hmm. like that at yeah, all some, yeah so it's really really specific and just remember that that 
reinforcement is so specific to the child or the person, mm -hmm. it's specific to where you are and what you're working on and everything like that. So you, that's, an, that's why yeah. it's important to make sure that you assess what to do. <laughs> okay, so going back to my okay. original question, you're doing a 10 yeah. trials and mm -hmm. on the first one you're prompting, yeah. but the child does it with the prompting, mm -hmm. if, let's say it's a full physical prompt mm -hmm. that you're having to, how much do you give a little bit of reinforcement? Do you give the praise for that or nothing? Well, it depends. I know you're oh, going to okay. hate me because I'm no. just going to keep saying it. No, then. that's good for me to know because sometimes I go, well, in this instance I think I should and in this instance I think I shouldn't. So mm -hmm. if it depends, that's it good. It does depend because if you're, if you're, if this is a skill that you've never worked on with your mm -hmm. child before ever and it's the first time that you're doing it with them, mm -hmm. then you, if they do it correctly with the physical prompt, then you may give like you know, a few seconds of their big reinforcer with its okay. arm wiggling or whatever it is. Um, and then as you go along and you start fading your prompts out, then you're gonna s maybe switch to just praise for the prompted responses okay. and then, you know, so, but again, if you're coming, if you were saying to me that this is something that we've been working on or we, we've done and they just didn't do very good in the last sitting, so now we've reintroduced the prompt, mm -hmm. um, then maybe you're not gonna give like the full who ha a dancing right. dog and pony show, but you're still going to give like a good, a decent amount of reinforcement because okay. they may, you're maybe correcting them and you do want them to be correct. So it really does depend. Okay, so depend. common sense and remembering what the goal is. I'm mm -hmm. guessing you know the goal is we want to make sure that so it gets taught. I think some basic general rules to work from to start with is that if you're teaching something brand new that your kid doesn't know, you're going to want to provide them with more reinforcement. So something that's okay. really much more reinforcing to them, you're gonna give them something more than just praise. Right. But if it's something that your kid has mastered and he's, it's fairly easy for them, then you probably don't need to provide such a high level of reinforcement. Okay. You're gonna want to start moving towards just the praise. Right. Mm -hmm. But if that's not working for some reason, then it's not up, reinforcing enough. You're gonna up, up the reinforcement, exactly. Like if okay. you, or you need to change your reinforcers. Right. So if you're not fine, if you're finding that you're not able to fade the prompts out, and you, you know your kid's not learning and the, the behavior's not increasing, then you need to maybe think about check your reinforcers and see if there's a problem there. Okay. But there's so many other things as well that could be going on. Like sure. you, you know, sometimes it depends on the context that you're teaching in and, and how your child is feeling that day. Like if you're if your child is having problems with attending because you've got builders like drilling in the next room, you may have to keep their attention by increasing your reinforcement. Right. Or if, you know, maybe your child's just not as motivated that day, maybe he's had a hard day at school or whatever it is, maybe mm -hmm. you need to increase the reinforcement. It really, really does depend. <laughs> and it okay. depends what you're teaching, where you're teaching, what's going on at that time. You're going to have to be flexible about it. Okay. So it is a little bit of a dicey thing. It's a big gray area. we got to use our common sense, mm -hmm. give ourselves a break, and say, you know, I'm going to try it this way and see what works. And if it, this doesn't work, then I'm going to tweak it another yeah, way. Yeah, because if you become too rigid about it, you, you end up with problems. You know, I see that a lot, say, with something like a token system. Yeah. Um, you want to be careful about not um, not fading your tokens too quickly. Like sometimes what happens is families, when, when once they get the behavior up to like a level that they really are happy with, mm -hmm. the, the token system keep, starts to get forgotten. Right. Um, sometimes it gets left behind. Maybe they don't, they forget to bring it or right. it sometimes gets, sometimes therapists give tokens, sometimes they don't, they forget. And then you run into the danger of the behavior decreasing because mm -hmm. you haven't, you haven't faded um, yeah. Slowly enough to keep right. it maintaining, you know, and it's very easy to do. It's that, but it's like if it's working, don't stop doing it. Right. Try to figure a way to like fade back. Right. Have a plan in place. Does that make sense? It does, and because it's human nature. I think for us mm -hmm. that if we've been working on something and then it gets taken care of, mm -hmm. we move on to the next thing, mm -hmm. and and we like cold turkey leave that thing, and then mm -hmm. we usually will have to come back and clean that up. So. Yeah, I mean, I, we things. do it. We do it in our personal lives too. Yes. Where we just expect people to just start. You know, that they do something, and we're like, "Yay, thanks so much!" And then we just expect them to keep doing it yeah. without having built into the, like, having reinforced the habit of it. If that makes sense. Absolutely. We just assume, and then we just start noticing whenever they don't do it, and then we're like, 
why did they not do it? But yeah. we haven't built in a reinforcement schedule for it. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. We had uh, an, uh, some further clarification on the footwork brain training uh, that they said easier to explain would be something similar to Dance Dance mm -hmm. Revolution. Do you don't know what Dance I Dance Revolution? I don't know what Dance Dance They're, Revolution. Uh, is. They they it started out in in video arcades as a big machine, and now they have them on video game systems. That it's a oh, a, it's a, a thing a, where you're supposed to follow a yes. pattern and imitate. What yes, you're and seeing. like they'll show you arrows, and you step with the left mm -hmm. foot, step with the right. So there's a visual component mm -hmm. to it that you have to match up timing mm -hmm. with the visual with the feet. So I think you know it's very similar to what you had said before that I don't think that anybody has done any studies yet on Dance Dance mm -hmm. Revolution to see if it what it does to the brain. Although that'd mm -hmm. be an interesting study. Yeah. But it's certainly likely, can build. Uh, it's likely to build your ability to, to do that kind of a task. So it's going to build your fluency at being able to maybe imitate, um, yeah. follow, follow direction kind of thing and be co and like coordinate your body. Um, just like if I start going to dance classes and I'm trying to do choreography, mm -hmm. I, I'm completely useless at it to start with. And I, I'm like, oh, they're going left and I'm going right. And then eventually you get better at it. So right. I can see that it definitely, uh, provided your kid has the skills to be able to do that. And it's probably going to increase muscle tone and that kind of thing. But as for what it does for other part in other areas of development I really don't know yeah I don't think anybody has done any studies mm -hmm. on that but a really good question and maybe somebody mm -hmm. will uh, you know lots of people are asking right now of parents and one of them in particular is the autism research group is asking mm -hmm. what would you like studies to be done on so if that's something that you'd like a study to be done on you can go to their website autism research group and say hey mm -hmm. I'd like to know wh whether this has an impact I mean they're certainly doing research in, in other area, other populations of stuff like that, like with older age people, mm -hmm. to see what helps keep your brain kind of ticking yeah. over. But um, with regards to de the developing brain, I don't know any. I don't know of any studies. Right. But that doesn't mean there aren't any. I just I'm not aware of right. it. Right. Right. Uh, I think we would. I think we would heard about it on the news though. If there was something about dance yeah, dance revolution, I, I think so. it'd be on the box. <laughs> yeah. They'd be talking about it going, and not this. You know, it, this yeah. develops brain. Yeah. Um, so very likely nobody has done that. But That's it's a very, very interesting, interesting comment. question. Yeah, it is a very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a social element, though, to the Dance Dance Revolution oh, for the kids. Do, do you well, do it with... Because sometimes you do it with somebody standing mm -hmm. next to them that they have different moves mm -hmm. than you do and self esteem, mm -hmm. and, you know, so it could if be very. You can get your peers to come over if you have it. I don't know. Yeah. If they think it's fun. It could be useful. Yeah, and, and people do it uh, in arcades and things, mm -hmm. too. So. And again, like if, you, if your kid enjoys it and you're able to get them doing it well, then that's something that they have, a skill that they right. can bring to their peers. And, and you know, it's Absolutely. like a good friendship building, getting right. a bunch of positive attention for your child. And if they like it, if it's reinforcing, mm -hmm. you can use that as a reward, as a reward for all kinds of things. Absolutely. Oh, very mm -hmm. cool. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about reinforcement. So stick with us. I'm Adele Nadowski, director and co-creator of Skills. Card eLearning is an online tool that has been developed by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Card eLearning is the training that is delivered to the ABA therapists at CARD to train them on the principles of applied behavior analysis and to equip them with the knowledge they need to essentially deliver the ABA-based techniques during their therapy with the children that they work with. ABA has been proven scientifically to be the most effective intervention for children with autism. At this point, even the Surgeon General has come out with a statement suggesting just that. So we know that this is something that children with autism definitely need if they're going to improve and um, live the lives that we're hoping that they're going to be able to live. By being able to train people on this one particular method that we know works and to be able to have all of your staff within your school settings on the same page, it allows you to take more of a multidisciplinary approach and there's definite consistency going on within the team. It makes sure that every person involved with that child's treatment program, including the speech and language pathologist, the occupational therapist, the teachers, the aides, all of these individuals to be able to be trained so that they can all work together effectively with the child. Ah! 
parents that are using CARD eLearning can use it either to train themselves and then after having done that they can implement uh, different techniques with their child in order to teach new skills. Um, but oftentimes parents might also be working either with an ABA provider, with a school, or they may have even hired their own therapist to deliver the intervention techniques. So CARD eLearning can be used um, either to collaborate with your school, it can also be used to train the therapists that are coming to the home of the parents, uh, or it can also be shared with the ABA provider so that that provider can find out about it and perhaps implement it within their organization and train their staff. You can also do um, reporting for your organization. So you can actually look and find out which teachers are progressing, what their quiz scores are, and actually we can give you reports as well that will help you to compare the different teachers and their performances. Card e-learning is really, really simple to use. You can log on to this as long as you have a computer, that's all you need, and an internet connection and you can work on it any time of the day, anywhere that you're at. When you log on, you realize that right away. First of all, um, on the top of the page, there's a navigational tutorial. It's a how to use this page button. Simply by watching that video, it'll all kind of unfold in front of you and it becomes extremely self-explanatory. Um, Cardi Learning has nine modules and you can basically go through those at your own pace. Um, you're going to be watching videos that are kind of like um, a storyboard with narration, but in addition to that, there's many different video clips of therapists actually implementing the techniques that are being described within the storyboard that you can also watch. And then, of course, you're able to pause, you're able to type notes right directly underneath the video that you're watching. You can save your notes, you can review them, and um, between each module, you do take a quiz, and once you pass that quiz, you can go on to the next module. And then after you complete all of them, you have a final exam. And by completing the final exam and passing with a score of 85% or better, you will be given a certificate of completion. Let me show you how easy it is to use Cardi Learning. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're having such a good time here with Evelyn Gould. We're talking about reinforcement and how we deliver reinforcement. And what I'm discovering from this discussion is that it's just not a black and white thing, which is good for me because in my head I keep thinking, how do I get this into a black and white thing? And it just isn't. And that's a really, uh, really good thing for me. I to mean, know. there's general rules like. The closer the reinforce, that you, the closer that you deliver the reward or whatever to the behavior, mm -hmm. the more likely it is to reinforce that behavior, or the stronger the reinforcement effect. The I, longer you leave it before you provide that reinforcer, the the weaker the effect is going to be. And in fact, you might end up reinforcing something else by mistake that happens between the behavior and the reinforcer. And we know, like, so there's there's some like rules. Yes, but there's some things that are black yeah. and white. So let's go over that one again. Mm -hmm. it, w the most likely success is when the reinforcement is delivered in close proximity mm -hmm. to the behavior to whatever the behavior was. To increase. Okay. Yeah. So for us as parents, we want to make it as immediate as possible. Mm -hmm. However, there are times when we can't mm -hmm. and that's when we want to bring in token economy. Yeah, exactly. That's why that's where to that's where token economies are very effective because mm -hmm. they kind of bridge the gap between the behavior happening and the delivery of the reward um, and the thing is that you have to it, it, tokens have to be paired so that's that's another thing we should talk about so how does something become reinforcing well basically it be, something becomes reinforcing because it's paired with something else that's already reinforcing yeah so when you're teaching your kid to use tokens you're gonna have to you can't it's no good just giving them a token and expecting them to be happy right because <laughs> they're gonna be like well, what's this unless yeah. of course they find the tokens intrinsically reinforcing some kids do some kids um, especially if you put like something on it that they really like right. some kids actually even find the tokens or if you give them like a penny I've had kids who love who are like really enthusiastic about money and they love that you just give them a penny and they put it in the jar mm -hmm. and then when they get the jar full then they get something else and that right. so tokens don't have to be like little pieces of paper right. or stickers that can be something else um, but what you want to do is give the child the token and then immediately have them exchange the token for something they really like. Right. So that way you're saying, 
this equals this, kind of like money. It's right. like you give me this, I give you this, right. thing that you really want. So in the beginning, if you're doing, you're starting this at home mm -hmm. and you're having control of all the circumstances, they in the very beginning you give them one token and they could turn it in right then. Yes, they immediately need to exchange it for what they really want. Right. And you're going to do that a few times until the kid, until your kid they get knows it. they get it and they're they're immediately given the token. They're like. Yeah. <laughs> Where's yeah. the toy? Yeah, exactly. Um, and once they've got it, then you can start increasing the number of tokens they have to get before right. they can exchange it okay. and build up. And that way, um, your kid's learning how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have said before that, you know, back in the dark ages, six years mm -hmm. ago, when we started working on token economy with my son, and they, the, the therapists would make these, like, really cool tokens that had all the, you know, Star mm -hmm. Wars or Legos or whatever he was into that week they had on it. But now, and I brought it up before, I had my phone sitting here, um, they have free apps mm -hmm. for your phones. It's crazy. And I, what I do now is if we're going to do something with a token economy, I'd hand mm -hmm. it to my son because he understands how to run the app better mm -hmm. than I do. Mm -hmm. And you can customize it. So mm -hmm. that you can change what the mm -hmm. tokens are. You can write right on it. I'm working for yes. this. He can put a picture on it mm -hmm. of the thing that he's working for. And you can set how many tokens you have to get. Mm -hmm. It's that Crazy it is. Easy. And again, it's important to remember that you don't have to have crazy fancy token system that beautifully made and everything. It's like, it's how you implement it that really matters. Absolutely. I mean, yes, like I said, you might get tokens that the kid is, really likes and that might be a, an added kind of bit of reinforcement for Absolutely. them. But ultimately, it's how you use the, the token system that really matters. So, for example, like we just said, making yeah. sure that when the kid does the thing that you want them to do, you immediately give them the token. Yeah. And you don't, you know, wait till you get back to the car and into the house and then give yeah. them the token because that's not going to be very effective at all. Exactly. It's very muddy. muddy. You don't, the kid, you know, it could be reinforcing anything there Absolutely. or nothing at all. So it's very important that you give it right away. There are all kinds of these free apps, though, this particular one that I use is called Easy Kid Tokens. It's free. And, and literally, I give, see, he, the last time we did it, I'm working for a haunted house party. He typed that in himself. I don't know if you can show that. And it's got uh, a picture. I don't know if you guys can see. And he's got his little tokens down here that he decided he wanted happy face ones. Mm -hmm. um, but for, a, you know, if you've got a smaller child, you could make this yourself. But it was very reinforcing to him to get to program in what that he wanted. And he had to get six of them. And it's great in order because you don't them. have to worry about forgetting your token board. Yes. Um, and carting stuff around and like losing tokens and exactly. I remember lots of trips of like having tokens in a pocket and you're trying to carry a token board and tokens and manage the child and it's all very cumbersome and annoying. Yeah, and so we'll that, probably show I'm in a really few minutes. I'm really excited about that. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. We'll probably show in a few minutes that I made one for his school year that's mm -hmm. uh, that's all with Velcro and you know and mm -hmm. I love that kind of craft mm -hmm. project. Um, Some but of us don't. I know not everybody does. <laughs> but what would happen when he was younger is that the therapist would make one for me mm -hmm. and they would give it to me to have in my purse but mm -hmm. you know then the velcro would be stuck to something else in my purse mm -hmm. and you know it has those kinds of problems but yeah free apps mm -hmm. um and and then you know when they're old enough they can program it mm -hmm. themselves which you know talk about you don't even have to do the preference assessment i said to him what do you want to work for and he's in there typing mm -hmm. and putting the pic i don't even know how to put the picture in but he knows how to do it <laughs> um whatever uh, but it can be uh, a really it's a it's a great way of being able to deliver a form of reinforcement it's delayed gratification exactly so fabulous um, and again like we just said it there's no hard and fast rules about how many tokens and what the tokens yeah. are valued at that really does depend on your child what what you're working on um, you know what they want to earn and how long you've been working on the skill and like yeah. where you are and like maybe if you're in a very challenging situation you're going to want the kid to be able to earn what they need in a shorter to period of time because mm -hmm. it's going to be hard for them to wait mm -hmm. then harder for them to wait than if they're in a more relaxed setting and so on so you really need to be flexible and f kind of figure out what n you need to do to motivate your kid or to kind of make it work we we had a response that somebody wrote in because I was saying uh, to the last question uh, that you know 
groups like the Autism Research Group are asking right now, what would you like research? So they want to know if we have the link to the Autism Research Group. Um, and Emily, is that something that we could, oh, it's, she's so it far is. ahead of me. <laughs> AutismResearchGroup.org. Right now there's a survey that you can mm -hmm. take on their website um, that asks you a bunch of questions, and in particular, what would you be interested in? We always have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox on on Fridays at 11 o'clock. I shouldn't say always. He can't always be here on Fridays, but he will be here this Friday as far as I know. And uh, he was saying that the main thing that the Autism Research Group, the main filter that they put things through is would if we're whatever study we're doing would is this something that a mom would find interesting and that a mom could use what mm -hmm. the information that we're going to glean uh which i think is great yep and and the sad thing is that actually there's not that many people doing funding research and doing research that is that kind of research most of the yeah. money goes to you know figuring out genetic um factors to do with autism or biological factors and so on and mm -hmm. and so it's really wonderful that they're doing that because we need more people doing actual Absolutely. real life treatment you know who can answer the question so what you know I find myself reading a lot of articles where I get to the end of it and think so what yeah. how is that helpful to me now how is that going to help my parents right, right now right. and the sad thing is it's not right <laughs> so it's really wonderful that they're doing they will really want to push doing some research that really can help yeah. people right now and I believe when people ask us what we want we should tell them mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, so they're asking what would you like research done on and they're going to listen so write to them and tell them you want uh, what what you want. Uh, I think that's wonderful. Okay, we're going to take another break, but then when we come back, we're going to come back and talk about differential reinforcement. Okay. All right, stick with us. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, the host of Skills Live. And in honor of back to school, I've got a little project that you can do at home that will give your child a clear idea of what they're working for at school and help you to keep track of what they're doing. There are a couple of different elements to this project, and I'm gonna show you first how it works and then how to do it yourself. So this element of the project stays at home. And what it says is, what are you working for today? So my son can look at this, and I like to give him five choices, but you can customize this for your child at whatever point they're at. Five choices might be overwhelming to them, or they might need more choices, but you can put as many of these tags on as you want. And some of the things that I know that he likes that he might want to work for are video games, being able to swim after school, a toy. We like to get the little Happy Meal toy from McDonald's. You know, you can buy it without getting a Happy Meal and he likes to work for Microsoft Points, we're at that point in the game, and a play date. He likes to work for a play date. And I can, these are Velcroed on so that I could switch them and put other things on. So this will hang in my kitchen, and each morning before he goes to school, he'll pick one and say, this is what I wanna work for today. I made it colorful because he likes that kind of thing, but you could make it all in the same color if you wanted to do that. So he would pick this one off and say, I want to work for Microsoft Points today, and this gets added to his little schedule. On the back of it, it just Velcros right on so that he can remind himself that's what he's working for, and his teacher can know that that's what he's working for today. And I broke up his day into the morning, recess, mid-morning, lunch, and afternoon. You'll notice that there's a sixth area. This is for his behavior. This is just for getting work done and paying attention, but this is for behavior, and he can be on green, yellow, or red. And my yellow and red stickers are there, so if his behavior was not being very good, this would come off, go back onto the Velcro, and he would need to put the yellow sticker on. When he was younger, he would have somebody else maintaining this for him, but now he's maintaining it himself. Um, also, there are stars and little tool symbols. So if he, at the end of the morning, if he feels that he has done a good job, he would rip one of these off the Velcro, don't you love Velcro, and put it right onto the morning like that, so he would know that he did a good job. If he felt that he didn't do a great job, and again, it's that self-monitoring that he's at before it was somebody doing it for him. But if he felt he didn't need to, didn't do a good job and he needed to work on it, then he would put the little tool symbol on. I didn't want to put a frowny face because I just want him to know that it's something to work on. 
And our deal is, at the start of this school year, that if he gets three stars out of the five, then he gets whatever he was working for at the end of the day. Although he does have to stay on green. By the time he gets home, he's got to be on green. So he knows, and this is a really a small one, so that he can look and chart his progress for the day, know what he's working for, and that when I pick him up from school, I have a clear idea of how he did. And if I start to see that he's constantly needing to work on things for recess, then I know there might be something to talk about with him or with the teacher. Um, it's a really good way of keeping track of things. So how do you make this? It's really simple. I've made it a little bit more complicated because I want it to last. Um, so I laminated it, and but the Velcro is really an essential thing. That's the biggest cost in this is the Velcro. You don't even have to use a computer if you don't want to, but if you want to use the computer, all I did was I went on Google and I searched for a scrapbook tag template. And I popped that in and I could make a text box in it and I could fill the text box with whatever I wanted. Um, so that was simple. This was just a, uh, a text box that I that I put in, but I could have done it by hand. And I did this on cardstock, and the rest of the paper is just regular paper. And as I said, I did it in different colors. So you can see on this piece of paper that I stacked my templates with my text boxes, and then I just cut them out individually. And I have here a sheet of laminate laminating film. So I laid things out that I cut. Here are the little stars, and I can just stick them on the little green dot or red dot. It's sticky, so I can stick those right on. And of course, I want to use as much of the paper as I can. Then I would peel another sheet of laminating, slap it on the top, cut them out. I have my handy little sticky dots for Velcro. On this one, when it got to where on the back to put all of the stickers, I put strips of Velcro. You could do that in, on both sides and just cut them out, but this was super duper easy to just peel off a piece of the Velcro and slap it right onto the thing. And it will last, and it also is functional so that if I wanted to only have three things on here, I could, and I can change these out if I decide that these aren't being gratifying enough. I could change them to Star Wars or anything that your child likes. Um, and I can also automatically change this that as he progresses in the coming weeks, I can then start saying to him, oh, now you have to get four stars in order to get the thing on the back and eventually say five stars. And to work towards generalization, I want to keep making this smaller and smaller. For right now, he's going to keep it on his desk. But eventually, I would have an icon on the desk that would let him know that only during breaks to pull it out and take a look at it. And in that way, I'm starting to be able to fade all of this out. You can do this for your child at home, and probably the whole project takes less than 45 minutes, and it'll last a really long time, and it's adaptable. So a great project to track your child's progress. And I'm sticking to my lamination sheet. It can get messy, but it's really fun to do. So good luck back to school, and hopefully this will be helpful to you. Thanks. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with our special guest, Evelyn Gould. We've kept her much longer than we said we were going to, but I said we were going to talk about differential reinforcement, but we only have a couple of minutes because it's almost time for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. But tell us what differential re reinforcement is, and then we'll talk more about well, it next week. Well, very simply, it's just providing different levels of reinforcement for different things. So you're um, distinguishing between certain behaviors for your for your child so for mm -hmm. example like when your child first takes a step everyone's mm -hmm. like clapping and like woo that's amazing yeah. but you're not going to provide that same level of reinforcement every single time that right. your child walks a step from there right. on in right you know eventually you're just consuming. like you walked a step so what very good right. <laughs> you know it'll, it'll right. go down to being like oh that was a great job and then right. you know maybe they're walking and you're like that's a great job and then they do something else like pick something up and you're like yeah woo 
amazing. So what you're doing is basically doing that with your kids where you're at the, at when they do something new or whatever, you're going to provide one level of reinforcement. But when they do something that they've been doing for a long time, you're not going to provide the same level of right. reinforcement. Right. That's all it really means. Okay. So something to be mindful of. We already do it mm -hmm. in our real lives, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to apply that to these very set circumstances exactly. with our kids now. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, wonderful. Well, thank you as always, and we'll look, for, look forward to next week you bring that list of things yes. that are potential reinforcers. So stay tuned for next week for that. We're gonna take a break right now, and when we come back, we're gonna have Nancy Allspot Jackson with us and do our Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. So don't go away. My name is Monique Erickson. I'm a senior supervisor here at CARD in the training department. What kinds of things should we take into consideration when working with preschool children? Well, when you're working with preschool age children, um, a lot of things you want to consider is one, that they, they are little, so you are working with children who maybe their attention isn't as, as long as you might expect. You've got to work on that. They're, they're young. You, um, they may be napping still or um, probably in the process of fading that nap out, but that nap may be still there. And so that's definitely going to be a variable in their day when you are trying to plan when is the best time to do some of these um, lessons. So um, they probably have more time on their hands because they're not um, in school all day, but that doesn't mean you know that nap might still be there, which would affect their scheduling of the day. Um, you know, what are their reinforcers? You know, things like that. You have to kind of consider for those children who are that age. What kinds of reinforcement should we give? Um, you know, that always is going to vary per child, so you have to um, kind of see what your child's into, but just the typical beginning play type toys, so um, if they're really starting out, you know, they might be still doing some of those cause and effect puzzles type things and moving in then to more kind of constructive play, so some of those um, Legos and blocks and things like that, if that's what your child likes. Um, bubbles, uh, some of the kids like music and things like that. You really just have to do an assessment of what does your child find interesting and, and fun and, and incorporate those things. Are there any secrets to keeping preschool children motivated? Well, you have to do what I was just talking about, really find those things that they find fun and reinforcing, and that's going to be your key to finding motivation. So you have to find what do they want, you know, and, and to start off at preschool, you may still be, um, especially if the child hasn't had anything prior to this, still working at those real tangible, maybe edible reinforcers to start off with, pairing those with other fun things, and then eventually getting rid of the foods and so, so forth. So you might have to... Um, what we call, um, you know, establish some of those reinforcers um, like tickles and bubbles and fun and fun activities. They may have to start off with pairing those with some fun, uh, the fun things with a cheerio or something like that to start off if that's what that child wants. But you have to have that motivation in place to get the learning going. Is there a specific amount of time that they can work? Well, I think that's really important. To stop and think about that. They're little, um, you, you know, they can't be expected to, um, you know, sit and attend for a, a three-hour session right out the gate. You know, they're little, they're, they're going to need breaks, they're going to need frequent breaks during that session, and, you know, th their attention isn't just going to, you know, you, you could schedule a three-hour session, but that doesn't mean that's going to be the best use of their time, that they're going to really be able to uh, maintain that time. So I really think you have to, you know, look at maybe doing two-hour intervals or something like that and just really decreasing um, or working up to, I mean, h how far they can handle um, and, and stop there. So I wouldn't do more than probably two hours to start um, in one sitting. How often should we give breaks to preschool children? Well, when you're giving breaks to kids throughout your session, you know, every child's different, so it's going to completely vary on your child. Um, you know, what are his what is his ability to stay focused and attend to, you know, to the task. Hopefully you're building up as this goes, as they have more and more opportunities to practice that. You're going to find that over the course of time, the children are better able to attend and sit for some of these tasks. Early on, it's going to be difficult. Um, so it's going to vary per child. Um, in general, I mean, you, you might do um, a, an activity or two and then have, a, and have them have a small break or so. Um, it really just depends on the child. You might, you know, do several lessons with small breaks in between, then go for a bigger break outside and get some fresh air, move them around, get some gross motor in there. Um, it just completely depends on, on the child and what are their targets. When, when can you allow natural breaks? into the um, session that might lead themselves into the next thing that you want to work on. But it's just important to really read 
their body language to how are they doing. There's no point in continuing with lesson after lesson when they're they're fading, they need a snack, they need a break, they need to move around, you know, they're children. They need to be able to move and, 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 and have some fun. The sessions should be fun, so they, they should be enjoying themselves. How long should the breaks be? The length of the breaks is just breaks is just gonna vary depending on um, your child and, and their ability to stay focused and, and how much of a break do they need. They're not extended. When I say a small break, I'm thinking you know we finish a tabletop activity, um, I they go to the floor and they and they have some some downtime kind of. Uh, but when I say downtime, that doesn't mean I'm allowing them to fully engage in stereotypy or self stimulatory behavior. Um, which might be something like lining up the, the, the cars or the blocks or something. It means that they're engaging in some kind of appropriate activity d when they're on their own time. Um, they're still being expected to utilize those skills that they're working on, but it's, it's a break from you know, a formal learning activity. Um, so those are the small breaks I'm thinking of. I mean, we do a couple learning tasks. They, they have a, a little bit of time to themselves, and then you know, that allows me as the teacher to re-set up and get myself organized and, and get my next lesson plan ready. And then, you know, after several of those, you know, you might you might want to find um, somewhere in between, however long you plan on going, um, a bigger break. So that you know, maybe you know they're little; they need snacks, they need to eat. Um, maybe it's time to go out and have a snack, and maybe that's just a pure break on its own, or maybe that's where you incorporate some adaptive targets you have, like you know, learning how to pick up using your pincer if that's a target. You know, you can incorporate that into your snacks if possible, but. You want to just make sure that they are getting, you know, frequent breaks and, and they're eating when they need to so that they can be fresh and, and as alert as possible. Welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Shannon Penrod. And I'm Nancy Allspot Jackson. Yes. And, and what April's over, Shannon. It, it is Hello. over. How uh, did that happen? I know it flew by, <laughs> did it not? May? It was an amazing, but how was it for you? Did you you had a busy month? I had a very busy month, Autism Awareness Month. I try to get out to a lot of events, especially Act Today events. Yeah. Um, so it started with going to New York for the Autism Speaks military family event on yeah. the USS Intrepid. Uh, then we had our um, Act Today for Military Families run yes, which and family show festival. Some video of that later, right? We're going to show some video of that. Wonderful. Then we had the Autism Speaks Walk, yeah, uh, walk now which, for Los Angeles. which was amazing. Yes. Uh, then I went to Special Needs. Needs Network Empower Tools yes. for Transformation Workshop. You did a lot then of things. Then I went too. to the Hacienda Oaks fundraiser. Yes. And a lot of this is for my job, obviously, running Act Today. I like to stay in touch with the community, yeah. see what the needs are, yeah. see what needs are being met by other organizations, see how we can partner, how Act Today can partner with organizations. Absolutely. So it was busy. Um, and how about for you, though? What, well, I didn't do a lot of those. I, you know, I'm a much more homebody. At, but I did this last week. I got to upstate New York for mm -hmm. something else. But while I was there, they were doing the Oswego Task Force. Oswego County Task Force was doing their walk for autism. Okay. So I got to go for about an hour before the walk started, and then I had to catch my plane. But we showed some pictures of that the other day on the show. And it was, you know what was amazing for me, Nancy, is that we went to the Los Angeles walk, and there were like 35,000 people there. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was just amazing, and I kept talking about the feeling, the feeling, and the sheer, yeah. you know, the, the, so magnitude. Many, the magnitude, right? The of magnitude, it and how huge it was. Yeah. And I, I kept thinking that it was the magnitude that was creating that feeling. And then I went to the Oswego Walk. I'm going to tear up because I did. I lost it. I got there, and I went. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter it's how many people. It's not the magnitude. It isn't the sheer numbers. It's the feeling that we all have. The togetherness when you put three people together, wow. it's still there. That's really a powerful message, it, Shannon. It was. It was so. And I. And I got all the clamps. You know me, and I get that way anyway. But so I'm standing there, and it was a bunch of moms that I have been able to talk to over the years mm -hmm. on Facebook, but never yes. met. Oh, and so and you I feel that kinship. Hug. Isn't oh, that amazing? We were when you bid, I kind of that felt that way meeting some of the people at the Autism Speaks Walk. Yeah. And uh, that, that I had been communicating with through email and on yes. social media. Um, but I think that's important, you know, to note that it's not about big. So, and we're going to be showing some celebrities today, yes. which is great. Yeah, it is. I mean, 
mean, I love it when celebrities have the courage yes. to come out yeah. and advocate for others. Yeah. I think it, it gives us all permission yeah. to do so and to express some of our challenges. So I, I applaud the celebrities, but it's not about celebrity. Yeah. It's about coming together and yeah. giving one another support. Yeah. And uh, when I first got here today, you were saying something else that's important, and that is, you know, we get so busy sometimes. I mean, for me, um, you, you know, I did a lot last month, and I always have to take a step back and look at my son and his improvement and recovery. Um, he's very high functioning now. Uh, we took him from moderately autistic to very high functioning, yeah. and I'm very proud of him. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I have to remember, he is number one. Yeah, yeah. You know, we talk about that all the time on the show about for, for you watching at home, we'll say, you know, here's something else right. that you can do, but always put it through the filter if you got to take yeah, care of what's happening. Yeah, got to take care of your child, your household. And, and we have to do that, too. We have to do that, too. And it's too. easy to get caught up sometimes. And, Very. you know, Jem's about to be nine, mm -hmm. and I've been really busy this last yeah. month and haven't... I haven't connected with him as much yeah. as I wanted to, and I gotta constantly go, wait a second. And it goes so fast. Their childhood yeah. goes so fast. Yeah. Um, you know, that when they're they're little and and Wyatt being ten, I mean it's just they're such precious. All the ages are precious, but you know, you gotta catch the joy as it flies, yeah. so and to we're, speak. We're right on the cusp of they're not gonna be they're not even little boys anymore, but no. that young boy thing. Oh I know. It's about to go. Yeah. And I and I wanna hang on to this as, as long as I can. The young I boy used thing. to have uh, a sign in my office that would go right on my computer that I would have to look at whenever I was doing anything that would say, Jem will never be this age again. That's very to important. To remind me. I think I'm uh, going to put that on my computer. Yeah. Uh, well, it isn't on my commuter, computer anymore, but this month it needed to mm -hmm, be. So mm -hmm. I think I need to put it up too. Okay. Because no matter, you know, it's good to get out and, and help and be a part of, yeah. but we got to take care <laughs> that, of you know, as well. That's why I tell my friends, you know, I really don't have time for anything else. Yeah. I have, you know, my son and his yeah. autism recovery. I have my work at ACT Today. Occasionally, I can run still. You know, I, yeah. I run, but I, I just don't have time for much else in my life. Yeah. It's like those two things are the major thing. Yeah, but it's a full, wonderful life. It is. It's a it full, is. wonderful life. Um, but we all need to remember that. Boundaries, yes. yep. and it's okay for us to say, no, I can't, I can't take on any more. Right. Right. So we're going to give, we're all going to give ourselves permission today to okay. say that. Okay, sounds good. And it's a new <laughs> month. Yes, um, a new month, a yeah, lot going on. Yeah. And we're going to talk about some stuff in the news later on, but we do have some more interviews from The Walk that we need to show. We do. And some wonderful celebrities uh -huh. and uh, some other people that we didn't get a chance to show last week. So shall we just roll yeah, that? Yeah, let's and, roll and we'll talk about it when we come absolutely. out. Absolutely. So take a look. come out um, because I feel so connected with families we're in this community and this year feels really different because we have this you know new prevalence of 1 in 88 and I just feel that energy of like all right it's time to get serious and what I love is that not only do we have a great turnout of close to 30,000 people, but it's the people around the teams that are growing. The teams are getting bigger. So you got one kid with autism and a team of like 30 people that come. And that means the community is getting involved. Okay. And of course, I'm on the board, National Board of Autism Speaks, so okay. I would be here regardless, but I get a lot out of it. All right, now tell us about your foundation. Well, Holly Rod is doing great. We partnered with Cal State Northridge, and we're going to open our first Autism Compassionate Care Center um, in Northridge, and we hope to be in all 23 campuses of the Cal State uh, system soon but the idea is you know and I was talking to families today we're still having to drive from here to there to here to there we need a one-stop shop much like the St. Jude model in Memphis where families can come get treatment not have to worry about paying for it and they can feel good about themselves. Rodney wrote a book. Can you just tell us yeah. a little bit about that? I think it's so important for the dads. I love Rodney's book. It's called Not My Boy. It's a father's journey with autism, and I'm so proud of it because Rodney calls the dads the forgotten parent sometimes. Um, and 
and uh, so it's just really important to have uh, his point of view from a macho ex NFLer, you know, talk about how he tweaked his expectations for his son, and I think it's been very helpful for for dads. I'm going to perform the national anthem in front of thousands of people. Are you at all nervous? No. <gasps> You're not nervous? How do you not be nervous? Because I know I'm going to nail it. Oh, high five. Shannon and I are going to be out there watching, okay? That's right, Nancy. I am here with Gary Cole. Now, you all recognize Gary, an amazing award-winning actor, and also an autism dad. Gary, you have a daughter. I do have a daughter. Yes, I do. And her name is? Her name is Mary, and she's 19 years old now. And I heard some very exciting news about Mary. Yes, Mary is off to Lynn University in the fall in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, so we're very excited about off that. To college people. That's right. That is what the right kind of treatment and support can bring. And this is a tough question, but what has this journey been like for you? I'm sure I'm like a lot of parents. You know, when you, at the beginning, there's a lot of uh, a lot of unknown. We found ourselves in a situation where we were, we were pretty fortunate. Uh, we got an early diagnosis, which I thought was very important, and uh, a lot of dedicated uh, specialists and teachers and therapists with her, her hard work, um, and me driving a lot. <laughs> She uh, she really, you know, she came a long, long way, and uh, she still has challenges, uh, some of them social, some of them academic, but, um, you know, she she seems very adaptable to them and, and, and actually knowledgeable and aware of them, which I think is important, and uh, she's, she's been amazing, and, and we are very proud of her. As a father of a daughter with autism who's going off to college, what advice would you give to a parent who has a child that's newly diagnosed? Do research early. You know, it's never too early when they hit high school to start looking at things, if that's your intention. Uh, and find a place that's, um, you know, gonna, gonna give them plenty of help if they need it. Why did you decide, at a time when I have to say, a lot of celebrities were not public about their children having autism, what made you come out and and bravely, you and your wife, Teddy, become spokespeople and activists for this situation. When Mary first got her diagnosis, and we were certainly uncertain as to what to do or what was going to take place, really the only resource that we knew that we had some kind of connection to happened to be some other parents that, were, that had gone through the same thing. Without their experience and their, you know, kindness towards us and sharing the information and pointing us in some directions that we had choices to get Mary help, uh, it would have been that much more difficult. And then so we thought, you know, as long as once in a while I was semi-visible, that maybe that could be used to, you know, kind of spread that um, process, which as you see here today, that's really what it's all about. It's really kind of helping the next guy. And there's that fear you get when, you, when you're told something that you didn't expect. But the amount of information, the more you get it, that fear begins to subside. Right. And that anxiety, and you just go and, and you do the next right thing. And I think that's what, you know, prompted us to say, no, we should, you know, we should should tell somebody about this. It's crazy. Just because you're on a TV show, you have some extra reach. So I take that responsibility to heart, and, and I want to just do everything I, can, I possibly can. Well, my best friend's little sister has autism, and she's been such an inspiration to us. And I have an amazing group of girlfriends. There's 11 of us here today. We're all around. And we thought this would be an amazing cause, an amazing day to get everybody together, raise as much money as possible, and, and 
and support the research. Right now, we're joined by a very special guest, Max Burkholder, and you guys know him because of Parenthood. He plays Max on Parenthood, the young boy with Asperger's, and you're doing a really wonderful job doing that. As a parent of a child, I am loving how you're doing that. But let's talk a little bit about what it's like for you as an actor and what kind of research you did to play somebody with Asperger's. Well, I, I do a lot of research by, I, by going on like uh, the websites of organizations that help to treat autism and uh, just sort of see what and try and see what they you know help to deal with and also every few episodes or so I'll get together with the uh, director and the executive producers and uh, a, a doctor who specializes in Asperger's and we'll just sort of talk about how Max would react in certain situations. Um, my son Kevin Hosseini is an artist in the book and he's 17 been painting since he was nine and I had tried to find venues for him to find um, places for his art to be seen and in the process I started um, curating shows for other people with autism and then it's kind of like an organic process how these books came about um, other artists started sending me their work and this book has 77 artists and poets from around the world featuring um, great art they are um, Asperger's and autism and it's stories of families love and determination it's not just the art and poetry it's really about families it's really emotional for me to be here every year I think you know well I get used to the walk and I never am because I think when Wills was little my son Wills who's now 14 um, I, w I felt so isolated like a lot of us do when we have kids with special needs and when I see this although I know because I work with Autism Speaks that all of these families exist but when we're all together it just even now I have chills it reminds me that I'm not in my own little dinghy but I'm in a big family with a ton of support and not just me but I see parents with the little ones and I feel so good that they're here and I wish I had been here when Wills was little I wish I had you know this had been here for us so it's really exciting and it's really emotional and how is Wills doing Wills is doing great. In fact, uh, Wills is with uh, Team Frosting this year, and uh, Frosting School is unbelievable. And their uh, school for kids with special needs, and their whole concept is to. Um, to bring them into Frostig and then they'll release them into mainstream schools. And Wills is being mainstreamed uh, next year, his freshman year, uh, just as we had planned when he came into Frostig. So Frostig did their job so well that we're so sad to leave them. But the teachers there and the staff, and I just can't tell you that school changed our lives. And they're here walking because uh, of all of our kids um, at, at Frostig with autism, but not all the kids there have autism, but they're here anyway because it's a it's an amazing school so yeah Wills is doing great he's over there he made a lot of signs he was very busy this week what are you working on now I'm working on my third memoir and it's supposedly we keep pushing back the pub date but now it's looking at um, a spring of 2013 release all right mr. Asner tell us about you your... you can call me cuddles I can call you cuddles all right cuddles tell me about your connection to autism well, I have a son who is autistic, and I have a grandson who's autistic. So I tend to think I must be responsible. Okay, and? And doing everything I can to absolve myself of the sin. All right, now what about parenthood? You have taken a real proactive role in getting the word out about autism and Asperger's on that show. All right. The point is to just keep talking and drive our enemies that's the uh, the keepers of the uh, funds in the city, state, and uh, feds. You know, drive them nuts until they fork over. Okay, that's the strategy. That's the strategy. Okay. All right. Well, I want to we'll thank. Make them give till it hurts. Okay. What do you think about the new numbers? One in eighty-eight. And one in fifty-four for boys. boys. What do you think about those? I think it's it's. Uh, uh, it's one of the few real assessments of our society that you can get these days. Okay. Uh, as opposed to unemployment. Now, if you had to say anything to an autism dad out there, a word of advice, what would it be? Celebrate. Celebrate. That's interesting. Do you see it as a blessing? It is. It is. We lived in an autistic world. It would be a more peaceful world. We live in an autistic world, it would be a patient world, an understanding world, a, uh, a reaching out world. We would, uh, we would extend ourselves and they in turn 
would be able to open up and impart the very special talent and knowledge that each artistic possesses. He had me in tears there at the end, right? I know. How delightful was he? he well, was I'm in so love gracious. with him. I told him. Yes. <laughs> we'll I said, break that to your husband. You know, I said, well, he knows. Yes. He says it's okay. I told him, I said, I cozied up to Ed Asner today, and I made him say to me, you've got spunk. He loved it. Um, anyway, he also knows I'm in love with Bruce Springsteen. It's okay. So it's all Okay. Good. So anyway, um, he uh, just touched me with his remarks, and uh, let's kind of talk about every, our impressions of everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Holly Robinson Pete. Oh, well, she's such a delight always. She's so on it always, and intense, and, and wonderful, and she's so beautiful. God, she's I know. She's so strikingly she beautiful. She is. She's gorgeous. Um, we love her husband, Rodney, uh, and we want to have him on the show. Yeah. Um, she kind of makes me feel like a slouch because she really? does so much. Well, she does you? so much. Well, you know, we've all got somebody that makes us feel like a slouch. She does it. so much. Yes, yeah, she does. And continues to have a career. Yes. And, you know, she's just really inspiring. And we saw... R.J., her son, who yeah. wants to be called Rodney now, and uh, yeah. And she's, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet her a couple of times when she's with her kids, and yeah. you can tell that she's a very hands-on Oh, mom, yeah, definitely. And that, you know, it's about her kids, mm. and I, I think that's one of the highest compliments that I can give. Yes. Because she'll be in the middle of an interview, but her children will be there, and she'll be talking to them, and you see clearly that that's where her attention is. Right. Instead of, you know, being in front of the camera. Yeah. And uh, she's a lovely, lovely person yeah. who's getting it done, raising a whole lot of money. She is for, and you heard about her partnership yeah. with Cal State Northridge. So That's we'll amazing. we'll try to get her on the show, yeah. and we'll also we'll ask her to come on, and we'll also ask Rodney, who we spoke about his book, which is so important for the dads. Yeah, absolutely. and I'd like to say to moms who might be watching today, get it for your husband, yes, get it for your child's day. father, and uh, fathers who might be watching today get it for yourself. Absolutely. And she co-wrote a book with her daughter as well okay. on siblings. That's a, it's a children's book that's a lovely book, too. That's so great. It's a great service. So she's been so active and so out there, which we applaud. Um, Hunter Brown, the little boy who he sang the national anthem. Now, I had been friends with his mother on Facebook and other mm -hmm. places, and we've been talking about having him to an event, yeah. and we will. Yeah. And is he not just a beautiful oh. boy and, and delightful? And I'm so excited to be yeah. there. And and you know, and, and to sing for that many people. And at one point, you said to him, "You know, you're going to be nervous." No, because I'm going to nail it. I just <laughs> loved it. And he did, and he was just darling. Um, then we talked to Gary Cole. Yes, and it wasn't wasn't he just amazing? I think both of us <laughs> just really loved him because the idea that he was one of the first celebrities to come he out. He really was. I mean, his daughter Mary yeah. is, as he said, going off to college, which is amazing. Yeah, and he and his wife Teddy Cole uh, became very public about this early on. Uh, they he is the spokesperson for the Help Group, which is one of the largest autism schools in the country. Yeah. And we will, in the future, have some people on from, from yeah. there. And Barbara Firestone, who runs that, is doing amazing work. Yes. Also a pioneer in the field, like Dr. Dorian Grampuche. Yeah. So anyway, Gary is the spokesperson for them. And he's been there in the early days when nobody talked about recovery. Yep. No, biomedical was unknown. Yeah. And they have gotten this young girl to college. Yeah. They have gotten this girl to college. Yeah, it's really amazing. Really amazing. And, and I have to say, there's something about when the dads speak that is just delightful for me because we don't see it as much. We just don't see right, it as much. Right. And to have an articulate male talking about his feelings, it, it's just you know, precious. A couple of years ago, my husband was honored. My husband, Reed Jackson, was yeah. honored by the Best Buddy Society uh -huh. uh, um, Foundation. Uh -huh. And Gary Cole and Rodney Pete were honored uh -huh. as well. And they all got up and gave a little speech about why they do the work they oh. do. And there wasn't a dry eye in the That's house, insane. let me tell you. Yeah. Not a dry eye in the house when you hear them talk about their children with autism. Yeah. Yeah. It is how it has transformed them as human beings, how it has made them better men. Absolutely. Better men. Yeah. And they know it. 
Isn't that a wonderful thing? We had Vince Redman on the show yesterday, who's a marriage and family therapist, mm -hmm. and we were talking in particular oh. about diagnosis and the dads and how a lot of times the mom and the dad will be on a different page. And and he was giving us some great tips if people want to watch that the rerun of that show. Oh, I want to watch about it about how we need to be patient and how we need to ask. How sometimes we forget in our whoever takes charge, whoever the project manager for autism is, sometimes right. takes charge and forgets to look back and say to the other person, "What do you need?" Wow. And that's Sometimes we need to prime the pump and say, it's, it's not always the dad. Sometimes the dad's Johnny on it and, and talking about it and the mom isn't, you know? And But to be able to say to the other person, what do you need? Mm -hmm. What can I do for you? What are What's the hard part for you? When my husband finally admitted what the hard part was for him, what was the hard part? You know, it's a very uh, weird story that we had been flying to my niece's wedding, mm -hmm. and it was about eight months after my son had been diagnosed. We'd already started ABA, but we got bumped off of all these flights, and we got stranded in Denver and had to rent a car. And my child had had diarrhea all over every plane, all over everything. So we were out of clothes at midnight at night in Denver, mm. having not eaten, trying to find, you know, clothes to change him into. Mm -hmm. And my husband broke down in tears. And I remember sitting there saying, now, now is the moment when you're going to break down and cry. And because I said, what, what's, you know, what's going on? Are you just overtired? Are you, you know, you want to go home? What? And he said, no, I'm just realizing that he has autism. And, I, and I'm, you know, I now, now in this moment and the week before he had gone to see a performance of To Kill a Mockingbird and our son is named Jem after the little boy in that play and we've had you know both of us have been our, our lives before were very involved in theater and so he was sitting there and watching the little boy playing Jem and realizing I don't know if our son is ever going be to like be able to, to perform in a play and uh, experience the joy you know how uh, Rodney Pete talks about I don't know if my son's ever going to play on play, a team yeah and that's what my husband talked about because he was yeah. at Fox Sports at the time Wyatt was diagnosed right. and it was very hard for him right. to never have a child that would play ball, to exactly. never have a child. But Wyatt is playing softball on go. a special league team, there you go. but he's playing it. And my husband was saying, will my son ever be able to be in a play? Is mm. he ever going to be able to speak so that he could memorize a line? Yeah. And feeling the grief of that after we'd had this horrible day on planes mm. and covered in diarrhea. And I reached across the table and said, you know what? We don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, we're in this together. And, and he said, you know, that's absolutely right. And maybe, you know, and my son has been in a play now. Yes. And, you know, so, but it was a real moment moment for me as the spouse to say, oh, he's having his own thing with we, this. It's different from mine. But yes. Thing. But I think I had lost that Nancy in my, we must get ABA started. Of course, you know? of course. We all do. We but all do. In any case, uh, Gary Cole was fabulous. And you got to talk to that lovely Kristen Ritter. I did. She and was she was either on The Tonight Show or Conan last night. Uh -huh. She is so delightful, and she was there uh, supporting a team of her friends, I think it was, who yes. has a sister with autism. Yes. And, you know, in that show, I guess she plays a real piece of work, <laughs> well, they call the, her bee. the bee. Yeah, and yes. really <laughs> self absorbed. This girl could be. The, she is the antithesis of that character. Oh, so natural and beautiful and sweet and down to earth. Yes. Not this vampy bee. Yes. So anyway, Wonderful. she was a delight. And uh, Max Burkholder from Parenthood. Yeah, darling. What a sweet teenager who's doing such a good job depicting <sighs> Asperger's on that show. Amazing. And the research that he's been doing and how conscientious he <laughs> has been about that. I certainly appreciate that as a parent. And did did you see that lovely book that Deborah Hosseini had from the Art, uh, the Art of Autism? I didn't get to look at it closely. Oh, this is a wonderful coffee table book that everybody should have. Okay. Uh, and featured some of the artwork that's also on the stamps that were featured by the UN this month. Oh. Really beautiful. Okay. Beautiful, amazing. There were poems in the book. There are sculptures, paintings. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, it's breathtaking. Okay. It's so interesting. I, I advocate everybody should get two. Keep one for your coffee table and one to give as a gift because okay. it's wonderful and it supports great arts programs for our kids. And then, of course, Monica Holloway, who we adore. We love her. Us. Yeah. If you haven't read Cowboy and Will's, her her really amazing book, she's got another book that's coming out, but I laughed all the way through Cowboy and Will's. Is little. her next book about autism? Well, she said it's a memoir and, you know, so obviously there, you know, some aspect mm -hmm. of it, but she was saying that it's more about going home. So we'll have to see uh, uh, what aspect going of Going home. Life. Yeah. So we'll have to see, but I'm sure 
sure that autism has touched every, of course. any other autism mom has touched every aspect of her life, yeah. so we'll see. Yeah. And then, of course, the lovely Ed Asner, who just, you know what was amazing to me was we were taking pictures with him, and my son was there, and my son was so excited because he's the guy from Up. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. He's so many things to us. God, but yeah, for Mary him, Tyler Moore for us. Right. And, 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 and he's and been on Hawaii Five O lately. Did you know that? Oh, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, doing guest starring roles. I mean, the guy is out there. He's still out there doing that. And, but my, for my son, he's the voice of the, the guy in Up. And so he was excited that he was going to get to meet him. And so he wanted to be in a picture. And so you and I were standing there with him. And my son came over. And I said to, I whispered in Ed Asner's ear, I said, this is my son. This is my boy. And everything changed in that moment. And he was all about talking to my son and so gracious with my son and having a conversation. And uh, I just thought that was so sweet. Because it had been a long, hot day. Yes. And it would have been very easy to, to just be like, you know, let's get a picture yeah, and get out no, of here. Very but, you know, very gracious with the children themselves. Yes, yes. And uh, so I thought that was really remarkable. And he, I think he was loving you just as much as you were loving him. <laughs> the two of you cuddled up like two little kittens. <laughs> He's very cute. <laughs> I think he's great. We will have him here anytime, any day to Absolutely. talk. And I am going to remember what he said about wearing the feds and wearing <laughs> down. the people wearing down. down in business. Well, Until you know, get the over. money, fork over the money, <laughs> help our kids, Show help our us kids. The money. That's right. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, but we want to show uh, another event okay. that you were at, the Act Today event, yeah. the Run for Military Families. Talk a little bit about what that event does and what it means. Okay. Um, we have a campaign or a program at ACT Today called ACT Today for Military Families. Right. And that program was started a couple of years ago when I became aware of, at that point, higher rates in yeah. the military of autism yeah. and the stresses and strains upon the military family. Yeah. And when I, when I found out about this situation, um, I, you know, talked to the ACT Today board and, and said, let's have a special program or fund for these families. Yeah. So we started it, and we started it with the help of a great autism mom named Karen Driscoll, who's now with Autism Speaks, heading up their military family efforts. And I have to say, I have to stop you for just a second and applaud you, because you really were the one who broke ground on this and saw the need and were the first one. And I love that there are more organizations that are now following I do, you. too. I mean, we but need I the really help. have to applaud you that you're the one who started Well, thank you. I, you know, I started it with Karen. Karen brought it to my attention and you know I said you know I'm new here I mean our first conversation that was four years ago then mm -hmm. I said I just took on act today and as executive director but I will start this with you yeah. so we did and um, we have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars specifically yeah. for military families so I'm very that. happy about that we also have a uh, camp coming up, mm -hmm. uh, a filmmaking camp mm -hmm. with Joey Travolta, Wonderful. Uh, who of course is John Travolta's brother, the right. name is so recognizable, but right. he in his own right is an actor, a director, yes. and an incredible teacher of special needs yes. kids. We're going to be having him on, cool. on May 23rd, uh -huh. and um, he's going to tell us about the program. It's going to be for military families, uh, children with autism who have parents in the military or a parent and their siblings. So Wonderful. typical kids can go as well. And it's going to be in San Diego, and hopefully we'll be doing more of these around the country. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to teach filmmaking skills. Yeah. So we're really talking about uh, an educational, vocational program. And the social skills that come from it are so amazing because more than anything, I think when our kids on the spectrum with Asperger's and high functioning autism and all along the spectrum, what they want is to belong. Yeah. They want friends. Yes, absolutely. They need that camaraderie. Absolutely. So this is going to give them that. And when you're a child with autism and, and your family, you're a military family, you know, you move on average every two years, yeah, Shannon. Can you imagine the stress? I can't. I absolutely can't. And then so, sometimes a parent deployed for a year. 
I mean, Karen Driscoll's husband was gone for a year in South Korea, and she, you know, her boys, you know, 14, that 13, 14, critical ages, you yeah. know, uh, to have a father figure. And, um, you know, my heart just goes out to these, these yeah. parents that are often temporarily single yeah. because they have a spouse deployed. So we started this. Uh, the run, the Act Today for Military Families Run and Family Festival, which we have every April yeah. in the San Diego area, yeah. down near SeaWorld at Fiesta Island. Um, it is a great way for the community to come together, much like Autism Speaks Walk Now. Right. Uh, we have this run, and, and fun. it's a fun walk, too, and a fun right. run. Right. And we have elements for the children. We have all kinds of fun things, bouncy houses, resource fair, yeah. entertainment, food. So so it's not just about the athletic activity, and right. you can have teams. So, and whether you're military or not, to support yeah. our military families yes. with children with autism. And when we give back, we get back. Yeah. It always works. It's karma. We feel better about ourselves. So we talked about the run. We prom we talked about it when we were getting ready for it. Right. And now we have, I believe, a video yes. that Emily, our technical director, has, and she's going to run for us now. And I can't wait to see. I didn't get to be there. I was going to be there. It was really fun. There, but I want to see. Yeah, so, so let's, let's take a look let's at take that. A look. This is the second annual ACT run for uh, autism and military families. We're down here in San Diego. It's absolutely gorgeous morning. All right, let's just stop moving. Let's move in those feet. I know it's a little chilly, so we are just arriving. Hey, you guys are looking good, and I want to remind you, you are running to raise money for an amazing cause. Our military families with a child of autism. You guys are heroes. Thank you. So are you ready to run? Go! Someone who's had a lot of friends who've had children with autism, and I'll tell you, there is nothing more heartfelt than watching the support that this organization provides for families and for militaries and for children. Whoa, look at this little silver bullet on the side. He's going to win it. Oh, my gosh. Tackle him. Way to throw down a killer personal best, of course, on your act today, 10K. See, look at that. That is a serious commitment to no limits racing. You know, a lot of times you hear things about autism, you think, you're hearing about people trying to find a cure, but what happens to the people who are living with it daily with their ch children? And Act Today supports them with grants and funding for a helmet, for example. And they say in, in the lifetime of a child with autism, you can probably expect to spend about $3 million. So Act Today helps out with this. One in 88 military families have autism. That's entirely too much. We have an autism epidemic. It's almost impossible for families to get the care and treatment they need, particularly the military family, who moves on average every two years. Oftentimes, they have a parent deployed. Their children do not get the care and treatment they deserve. I hope all of you guys enjoyed running today. We're extremely humbled to get to be the title sponsor of this great event, and it's going to grow every year. We started off as a small company with a big vision, and a few years later now, we've uh, donated over three quarters of a million dollars thanks to uh, generous support and generous marketing from our charitable partners. All right, here now we go. On five, four, three, two, one. This is International Beat Mega Radio Smasher. time of my life and I've never felt this way before yes I swear this is true and I owe it all to you oh I I just wanna make it pop, pop. I was going to give up That's 
The fact that you have the band going, you have friends here, you have just a great atmosphere, why not come out and you're in Southern California? You can't get better. <laughs> I want you to know you made a difference today in the lives of families with children with autism. You guys are amazing. You're activists. You guys rock. Bye, everybody. See you next year. This event would not be possible if we hadn't had the tremendous support of a sponsor. We encourage everybody, join us next year. The party's going to be bigger and better than ever. Okay. Well, that was delightful. Okay. You're coming yes. next year. Yeah, I wanted to come this year. Yeah. I just was double I know. You going to the uh, emergency That's right. So I, you had a I, really I, good was, excuse. And, my intention. And, you know, I don't take Wyatt because I'm working and I'm yeah. running around, you know, dealing with everybody. But there was a brief shot, and I said to you uh, while we were watching, that father, uh, that girl has Rett syndrome. Yeah. And I talked to the father afterwards who yeah. was retired military. And sometimes when you see the courage yeah. of some of these families, mm -hmm. it really, really causes you to pause and reflect, to express gratitude, yeah. and to realize there are so many heroic families out yeah. there dealing with so many levels of autism. Yeah. You do that gratitude check. Yeah. Because whatever you're going through, there's that moment when you realize, oh my gosh, yeah. people are going through this on a level that I don't even know about. And this father had heard me on the radio somewhere mm -hmm. and had come out and entered uh, and was pushing his daughter, uh, did the 10K with his daughter in a real wheelchair. Mm -hmm. No spring chicken, this guy, you know, great shape, looked like a military guy. Right. Um, and, uh, you know... You, you look at a father like that and you realize the challenges he's yeah. been through with dealing with his daughter's challenges. Um, yeah. And you just got to say there are just there are everyday heroes out there. And yeah. we know that to, yeah. to everybody that's listening. And it's amazing that part of this journey is getting to meet those people and yeah. to see that kind of courage. I always say I've yet to meet the autism parent that I don't like. I know. That's an amazing thing. You know? I know. Uh, but I also have to say, on a much fluffier note, <laughs> that I was giving Nancy grief during during that while I was watching, and I, and I was going, "Look at you! You always wear the right thing. You always look appropriate. You always." And I said to her, "I said I, I kind of love you for it, and I kind of hate you for it." And yeah, uh, I said, "That's okay. Tell everybody that." <laughs> because you always have it pulled together. Well, that, and, you know what? I think that's from my background in television when yeah. I was a producer and helping hosts get dressed, like Lisa Gibbons. Yeah. And yeah, I just I worked with Vicki Lawrence, Lisa Gibbons, the mommies, a lot of different people, Richard Simmons, a lot of different people. And I was always having to help well Richard no, he wore dolphin shorts. <laughs> but um, but Lisa was a particularly elegant person, but as an executive producer, you work with them on their look, you work with them on everything. Well you're so, gonna have to take me in hand. At I'll some take point, you in hand, I'm, but I want you I'm to know <laughs> that Everything I wear is really old. I just wow. happen to buy classic because everything has to be easy. As an autism mom, you know, everything has to be easy, especially you know if you're working. You know what I want to do at yeah. some point? I want to have, I want to give away a makeover and have some autism mom get a makeover that you take okay, from we'll, shopping. Okay, you know what? We'll with. bring in the makeup person. We'll bring in the hair. I've got it's people for it. Good. Let's do it. Let's do that. Let's do I it in May. Very exciting. For it, we'll get a winner for Mother's Day. Okay. Okay, All we'll right. do it in we'll May. Work on that. Okay, okay. wonderful. Um, but what a lovely event. And Lovely raised event. Some serious money. We raised some serious money, uh, a little over a hundred thousand. That's amazing. It's going to go directly to. Especially I mean, in this we do economy. have some event costs, but after that, everything goes. Once we take out a little bit of the event cost, it all goes to the grants. What a wonderful thing! And uh, next year, it's going to be bigger and better than ever. We're going to yeah. start promoting it early. If you can help us promote it, yeah. if you can help us with a team get started early, right. we need you there. We need we need people there. We need people to run. We need people to fundraise. Well, and one of the things that you guys said to me early on when I first found about uh, what well, what you were doing was that you were saying do a lemonade. Stand. Absolutely. Sell hot dogs. Every Absolutely. five dollars that you send, every ten dollars that yeah. you send, it goes to a family in need that's in the military, and it all adds up. That's right. So, you can have your own point. event. We encourage yeah. people to do that, and we'll help walk you through it. Okay. Wonderful. 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 Now.
we have a lot of things that have been going on in the news. Right. Some of them it's going to slow down, I think, a little bit now because uh, everybody waited, from what I understand. Is this what you heard to release the uh, findings oh, of I studies? Oh, I have not heard that, but that makes a certain amount I of sense. I heard that in order to get the most press, that a lot of these are you going, ah, now I get it. But a lot of the publications, a lot of the um, organizations, a lot of the institutions that were putting out the information, they waited until April because they thought more uh, media, uh, television stations, newspapers, radio would be interested in finding material for Autism Awareness Month. Now, that is the reason we do our run in, in April. It's the month of the military child and Autism Awareness Month. Right. But a lot of these studies and news breaking stories as well. So um, a lot of the scientific journals. Mm -hmm. So we have had a lot of information coming yes. at us yeah. and sometimes you and I uh, before you know when we're planning each week's show yeah. we will sit down and we'll go you know what's interesting what do we think is going to be interesting to everybody that is watching us right. and sometimes you know we're really coming through really looking other times it's like oh my gosh there's too much yeah. and that's this month in April oh, it's been so like much. that so we'll, we'll so do you want to kind of go through some of the things we haven't talked about yes. with some our viewers and then let's kind of give brief reactions yes. and yeah absolutely okay. that there's a, a new study that came out that they're calling it a promising possibility of a drug to treat autism what they've done is taken mice that have specific traits that seem to be autism-like. Okay. Uh, repetitive uh, or lack of social interaction. Right. They gave them this drug, mm -hmm. and they're seeing that it has... So the drug is called GRN-529. Okay. Um, and in particular, social isolation and repetitive behaviors that the mice displayed. Now, keep in mind that these were mice who were born with these characteristics. Okay. So we have no idea whether this so is going to So mice are actually children. born with those characteristics. Yeah, and, uh, apparently. That is really uh, interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? They injected them with this experiment. Mice that are on the autism spectrum. Yes, and it reduced two of their repetitive behaviors, excessive okay. grooming and jumping. Okay. Uh, that are normally associated with rodents engaged more with other mice. So okay. it reduced those. They're saying it's not a cure by any stretch of the imagination, right. but that if it were to also reduce repetitive behaviors mm -hmm. in children with autism, that it would leave them more likely to be able to benefit from uh, ABA behavioral therapy. therapy. Absolutely. And so, access a curriculum at school. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, one of the reasons why I think you know, I as a parent would ever consider a medication of any sort, a right. pharmaceutical medication, right. that if it helps my child access a curriculum, really helps them absorb right. therapy better. If they've got behaviors that are really be interfering yeah. with them absorbing, um, you know, therapies that we know are proven, right. then, or their education, if they exactly. can't access learning in the classroom, exactly. you know, I think you can consider, but as of now, to my knowledge, there are no pharmaceutical drugs that conclusively do that. Is right. that correct? That's, uh, there's nothing conclusive. There is nothing, nothing conclusive. Nothing. And if this becomes conclusive, now I understand that. It's the, a long way out. And the science officer from Autism Speaks is involved with this, I understand. He's the nonprofit Ring, is his name, I see, uh, with I don't Autism know where Speaks. You're yeah. That. Oh, there Ring, you are. There yep. You, yep, there you are. Robert Ring uh, was involved with the study. Vice President of Translational Pfizer. Research Pfizer yeah. with Autism Speaks. So uh, Ring says the possibility of the drug that could treat the symptom of autism, even if it's not a cure, could improve the quality of life for autistic individuals by making behavioral interventions more effective. That's right. the quote. Um, so this is not just, this is something that an autism advocacy organization is involved with. However, they're saying that it, even within the study, they're saying they have not made the leap from the mice to people people they're going to they're starting a study with uh, a group that are uh, from fragile X okay I have that disorder and they're gonna see what comes of okay that. well that's the first step right that's the first step okay, so good. interesting you know just to keep you up to date on these okay things, but they're pretty far away from now okay. here's the the new one if you remember that uh, about a month and a half ago we told about a study that showed that smoking is not one of the risk factors that they could not find that there was any correlation to smoking and prevalence mm -hmm. with autism. Now, there's a new study that has come out that says smoking during pregnancy may increase autism <laughs> risk in children. All right, so who do you exact believe? Opposite. Hello. Right, who do you mm. believe? 
Although, and, and they say in particular in this case, Asperger's, high functioning Asperger's is more likely to occur if the mother has smoked. And they, they cite the fact that what we said, which is we know that the incidence of low birth weight children, they're more at risk for having autism. And that when you smoke, you're more at risk for having a low birth birth weight child. So they cite a bunch of, in this study, a bunch of different reasons okay. why it may cause someone to... All right. Does, more do they say in the article that because the child is possibly low birth weight, they might be more susceptible uh, to environmental triggers. They do discuss the fact that when you are smoking, the, your fetus's ability to be able to get rid of toxins is greatly Okay. Hazardous. So they do cite that. Well, you know. Our, and they cite a bunch of other things aside from autism, cleft palate, um, you know, st miscarriage, stillbirth, premature, low birth weight, uh, okay. all of those sudden infant death syndrome. That So there are a lot of reasons why you should not be smoking. But I... I do believe that some of this information needs to be presented in full, and I know it's hard, like in a headline, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, smoking causes low birth weight, which makes a child more at risk for environmental Absolutely. risk, it triggers, which we know. I don't, I don't know that <laughs> yeah. they've been able to put it all okay. together, but it's okay. common sense right. uh, to a certain uh, different degree. Yeah. Now, here's uh, a new study that I thought was, uh, initially I looked at it and I went, duh, why are we doing these studies and when we already know this? But the headline is, being left out puts a youth with special needs at risk for depression. Okay, that, my reaction is sort of, that would be obvious to me. Right, duh. But what I do appreciate is as they questioned uh, a whole bunch of individuals with different special needs. So mm -hmm. It wasn't just children with autism, and they questioned them about their depression and why they feel depressed. Uh, the quote that is really interesting to me here that they say is, what is noticeable about these findings is that despite all the many challenges these children face in relation to their chronic medical or developmental diagnosis, being bullied or excluded by their peers were the factors most likely to predict whether or not they reported symptoms of depression. Mm -hmm. So we've talked on this show a lot about bullying and excluding children from things and how important it is that they not be excluded, but here we have yet another instance we're showing that those children are also, and of course it's a duh, that of course they're going to be depressed if they're being bullied. Their, their incidences of that are going to go up. But what we see is that despite all the other things that they could be depressed about, this is the most likely factor that will predict whether or not they're going to be depressed. If that doesn't say to people that this needs to be worked on, then I, I honestly... Of course it does. And as inclusion... Mm -hmm. becomes more, uh, as inclusion is promoted and, and needs to be promoted. A, a crucial part of inclusion is educating mm -hmm. uh, typical children mm -hmm. about children that are atypical, mm -hmm. children on the autism spectrum, to show love and compassion and support for these kids. Absolutely. But you know what I have to add to that, Nancy, that it seems like to me, and, and, and you know, only in my experience, but the kids are, are so willing to learn that. They're mm -hmm. so willing to learn that, but it's their parents we got to educate more. The kids, okay. get a little bit, that yeah. give, and they need to have the program, right. absolutely, but they're willing to take that ball and run with it. If All you right. give it to them, well, and, I, and I love that, but it's the parents that are the harder nut to crack. There's a lot of programs being developed. We're developing one at today yes. um, and um, that'll be launching in the fall and, uh, and tell us again what the name of it is well it's called the compassion project and compassion for autism is cool yes so compassion and we're going to be working cool. with some young people on this spectrum to get them out there to speak yes. on this issue so and I love that yeah but I I, I want to add as you guys are doing it I want to add a component where the kids take it home to their parents I agree that is so important that's what needs to happen. that is so important and um, there's we also should speak with the uh, autism organization for autism research because they have yeah. a great kit that is about a boy with autism coming into a classroom ah. and how he may be different. Yes. So some of the things kids should be aware of. So we'll we'll get them on the show or we'll share that information. I'll remember to bring that Fabulous. in. But I, I would like to put it out to, to everybody who's watching and you know I think we need to bring some of these stories to light about mm -hmm. the you know how children are being bullied. Yeah. So maybe Nancy can use those in examples yeah. as they're doing these uh, presentations. Right, right. And we uh, did talk uh, last week 
before we went into some of the teams and families we met at the Autism Speaks Walk. Yeah. We talked about the father yeah. who uh, yes. audio recorded his son's teachers and aides at yes. his school in New Jersey, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, I believe. And that and was the big story of the week. It I, was you know, huge. I'm not really sure where it's gone. Have you been following it? Because I have not. I, I have. I, I will admit that I have not. I was in New York, and so I have. I have not followed as I much. I haven't so either. I okay. So we'll, uh, we we'll, did reach out to the father. Yep. Uh, his email bounced back because it said it was, you know, I think going haywire. He probably had every network news yeah. cast and morning show calling him. <laughs> um, but and, eventually, we hope to have him on and to right. To talk and with him about you know, what's from what on. the feedback I'm getting is he's a folk hero. That, I mean, basically, parents and kids on the spectrum, I talked with Jesse Saperstein yesterday, who yes. we had on the show, yes. who has an anti-bullying campaign, uh, a young man with Asperger's who's out there doing public speaking and does work with ACT Today. He said, I think he's a folk hero. Yeah. And a lot of parents have said that as well. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see where that goes, because you know that's I, important to you know. You know what I did hear? Uh, this, I did hear one thing, that the teacher is saying that they that she was not in the room when all this was happening she was ah. saying it was AIDS and that she was not in the room now well, I don't where know, was she well that she, <laughs> she went on a coffee break and I'm like it's an extended coffee break from what I heard on the tape it'll be very interesting but that that is the defense that was offered up was that she was not in the room and that one aide has been assigned to a different district or fired I believe one or the other and that I don't know okay but, uh, probably the aide whose voice you hear the most who is the most appalling who caused the child appalling obscenities, mm -hmm. who says things to the child that are so damaging for his self-esteem, who speaks so inappropriately in a classroom that when I have friends of typical children that heard this, mm -hmm. they were enraged and doubly enraged that this was a child with special needs. I have to say, it's that shocking. was the universal reaction. It's, uh, you know, everybody, uh, I was at this event on Friday, it was a drama festival, and so there were all these teachers and all these high school students, and it was the topic of conversation. Had nothing to do, this event had nothing to do with autism, but people were talking about it. Mm -hmm. And and I kept being drawn into the conversation uh, about it, but everybody was talking about it and saying how shocked and outraged yeah. they were. Because bullying is universal. It's not just our children, although more than 80% of children on the autism spectrum are bullied. So it is a particular interest if you have a child with autism. Yeah. This is a really important issue for parents who have children with autism. Yeah. We have to work on this. Yeah. But it, 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 bull, the, the anti-bullying movement has become huge, and I am so happy to see that. I am so happy to see Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, once again, celebrities in our culture yeah, really lead the way when it comes to public opinion. So there's so much about bullying, the movie bully, but yeah. bullying with autism is its own issue. It is. And we have to get that front and center in yep. the conversation. Absolutely. So I think this is an important study. Yes. As you say, it's not a, well, duh, it's a we need to look at this yeah. and we need to take this more seriously Absolutely. and we need to look at where adults are on this and we need to realize we set the tone for our children that teacher that aide who is so uh, appallingly uh, inappropriate and cruel sets the tone for the other aides, sets Absolutely. the tone everywhere. And, and the head teacher. in that room and heard that and didn't report it before the tape came out is as responsible Absolutely. as the person That's who said like it. That's like watching somebody, uh, you know, being attacked and standing and there nothing. and saying nothing. Okay. So we, we do have to be accountable. We have to be responsible. And I'm off my soapbox. What's next? <laughs> Well, we're at the end. This is the okay. end of our hour. <laughs> wow. So I know it flew Next by. time I won't, I won't go on and on and on. No, but it's, I think I just uh, get, that's, <clears throat> that's part of our job okay. is as mothers to be that right. way. If right. not us, who? Okay. Uh, so you get on that surprise, All right. girl. I was saying earlier, she's fierce. Did I not say that? <laughs> and I'm glad you're on my team. Because okay. I, uh, absolutely, I think we need to get fierce about it. All but right. in any case, as this show closes, the conversation continues. And the conversation continues. Please write us. Please tell us yes. any topics you want to hear. And just give us feedback. And we want to hear from you, your questions, your feedback, everything. Yes. We're, we're here always uh, to support you and continue the conversation. But you, we don't want to be mind readers. No. Right? No, Never. we don't. Uh, 
but we are going to be back next week, and we've got some really exciting shows in the hopper. We for do. Them. Coming up, as I said, we've got uh, Joey Travolta coming up to talk about uh, the Inclusion Films camp and the things that he's done with children yes. with autism. Amazing. But it's is it next week or the week after that we have week Valerie oh. Vanneman? I'm not sure, but we'll put I it on the Valerie, okay. Valerie, Valerie Vanneman. Vanneman uh, wonderful special education yes. attorney with us next week. Okay. We'll check that. Uh, but really exciting. A whole bunch of guests that we have lined yeah. up for you, so it should mm -hmm. be really wonderful. But we yeah. will enjoy your comments. So and watch, watch us. us on watch us on Blip. Okay. Watch us on YouTube. You can download us now on iTunes as well. It's a free download. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've done that yet, but it's a really I haven't yet. And I'm 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 juggling so much social media and technology. I get, I'm overwhelmed. But it's very exciting to be okay. able to download us on iTunes. <laughs> iTunes, and if you want to give us a review on iTunes, we really appreciate that. And very soon, you'll be able to download just the audio portion. So if you want to listen to it okay. while you're running or walking or in your car, you can absolutely do that. Nancy, I, it's always such a thrill. I love it when you're here with us. I had so much fun. And, and we'll see you next week, so make it a great week with your kiddos. That's right. Bye-bye right. <laughs> till then.